going to turn it over to you. Maybe. All right. It is 545, and we will open the public hearing. Um, the public hearing is about the board to ac accept anticipated revenue from health trust sale of vehicle and copiers. And Amy Facey, our business administrator, has the information. Yes. So tonight we have three items for this public hearing. The first is unanticipated revenue for FY22 for the return of surplus funds from Health Trust for medical and dental premiums. The second is unanticipated revenue for FY22 also for the sale of a truck. And the third is unanticipated revenue for FY23 for a buyback of copiers in the Sohegan School District. So as best practice moving forward, we will be looking to have public hearings to accept all unanticipated revenue that was not budgeted. This is important because the district is not able to spend more than what has been legally appropriated, even if there is offsetting revenue. So to avoid potentially spending over the approved appropriations, grants and other unanticipated revenue should be accepted at a public hearing. Uh, grants are now able to be expended over multiple years, so going forward we'll need to determine the ex expected spending for the year and then ask the board to accept and expend the estimated amount. Once approved to accept and expend the revenue, the budget may be amended so that the revenue and appropriations may be increased. This public hearing is the first step to move towards best practices. For Health Trust, on November 23rd, 2021, the SAU received a return of FY21 surplus funds for the SAU 39 districts from the return of surplus uh, from, from medical and dental premiums. So Hegan's portion of this return is $164,744. And this public hearing is to authorize the Sohegan School Board to accept this revenue. Should the board approve to accept this revenue, we will isolate the funds as their own account line so that they can be tracked easily. For Sohegan, we do not expect sp spending to exceed what was ap uh, appropriated. However, as stated, this is best practice and we're looking to accept revenue consistently across the districts. Additionally, according to our current unassigned fund balance projections that will be reviewed at next week's meeting, the return of health trust surplus funds will be available to return to fund balance to offset the FY23 tax rate. Should the board approve to accept this revenue, as I said, we will be sure to isolate those funds so that um, they'll clearly stand out and can be tracked for return for, uh, to offset the tax rate. The second item is the Sohegan truck. So on November uh, 29th, 2021, the Sohegan board approved the sale of a truck for $45,100. The board also approved the purchase of a replacement vehicle for $43,754. And this hearing is to authorize the Sohegan board to accept this revenue from the sale of the truck to be applied towards the purchase of the replacement truck. And the difference between the sales price and the purchase, those funds will just go to uh, fund balance. The copiers. So over this past year, it's become evident that many of the copiers in the school districts and SAU are at or nearing end of life. After a review of existing equipment used to copy and print, it was determined the most efficient plan was to drastically reduce the number of printers and replace the outdated copiers that are constantly breaking down and are difficult to service. After a review of quotes from three vendors, the proposal from Budget Document Technologies was determined to be the most competitive. Budget proposes replacing 20 district copiers with new Kanoka Minolta leases. Four of the newer copiers will remain in service. This proposal also includes the paper cut solution, which is a, um, a way to track and manage printing that will reduce waste and hopefully save us a decent amount of money. In addition, budget will buy back the old copiers for a total of $28,000, of which 7,000 is for the Sohegan copiers. This public hearing is to authorize the Sohegan School Board to accept this revenue. These funds will be used to reduce costs associated with copier equipment during the FY23 school year. After FY23, while, we, while the estimated annual cost may increase a small amount, the paper cut solution will encourage efficiency, which should realize savings. And um, 
perhaps most importantly, we will finally be providing our staff with up-to-date functioning equipment, which has been uh, an issue in all of the districts. So I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, let's open it up. So Adam, it's for the public to answer questions yeah, first. Uh, the board should make a motion to open the public hearing and hear from the public. We'll close the public hearing and then discuss it with the board. Oh, okay. So I guess we'll open the public hearing. Anyone in the public have anything? Motion to open the public hearing. I'll make a motion to open the public hearing. To say all that again. Second. <laughs> Dan Bay, you seconds. Uh, if we're all here, we can just raise our hand. All in favor? Any opposed? Opposed? Okay, public hearing is now open. <laughs> now we could ask if anyone from the public has anything to add, any questions. And seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Can we take a motion? I'll move to close, to close the public hearing. Second. First and second. Uh, all in favor of closing the public hearing? Anyone opposed? None opposed. Okay. In regular right now. Okay, so board discussion. But I saw your hand up earlier, Anna. My little question is: so yeah. the copiers are going to become a printer. We're going to yes, there are copiers and printers, right. and which yeah, and we can we can um, re drastically reduce the number of printers, which are very expensive. Right. So it will. That makes good sense. Yeah. Yep. And then we said, had to, this is what we're moving to. I didn't necessarily see those costs carry forward. So, I just wanted, so those are getting retired. Yes. Only four copies remain, and everything will be under the Kanika Minolta. Except, space, yeah, except for the four that are remaining that are under Canon. Okay. So yeah. Canon keep doing the service when those. Yeah. Are. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were recently bought, so it didn't make any sense to replace them. Yeah. yeah um, you said uh, that the recommended is the budget document of the three bids. Budget yeah. technology. Budget yeah. document technologies. Yep. Yep. So I just looking at I mean, this isn't really about the equipment breaking down, but right now we're spending forty six thousand dollars and change for printers and copiers. So our cost is going to go up twenty grand just for the printer or just for the copiers. Um, across the four districts yeah not just for Sohegan right but still that's just the principle of it like it is there a I mean it wasn't I don't know how to articulate this the as the, the, the sort of the status quo model wasn't really presented in the memo or what it would cost to do this on our own because we, we, we purchase all this stuff we own it so I don't really have a good sense of um, uh, what that would look like if we were to purchase our own equipment as to having leases going forward, especially at, at a cost of you know $15,000 more a year for what we are already doing is less money. So I'm a little confused about, about that aspect. Yeah, so the, the, the printers have been um, some of them are not functioning anymore. Printers. So I believe there's one at Sohegan and the Sohegan office that isn't working. Um, we've had uh, copiers at the middle school that have had to be serviced on and off. It's difficult to find. They're old pieces of equipment. Um, we had we went for maybe about a month before we could find toner. Uh, so it's been a significant issue in terms of having functioning equipment at the districts. Um, there was a, uh, for one of the districts, there was a, a $12,000 line item to purchase a new copier. Um, that district is in default, so we're not able to do that. So this is, yes, there is an increase in cost, but should one of these pieces of equipment break down and then we're forced to um, either buy a new one or lease one, it, it will end up most likely being more money. Okay, so yeah, certainly no dispute on the need for a solution. Yep. This, um, it was hard to evaluate the options when only the proposals were given. I didn't really understand how the printers 
fit into the whole equation either. Um, so printers are being used like copiers and like this one here, for example. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so it um, it costs a lot more to print a page than to copy a page. So we're also looking to um, hopefully have some additional savings with the, the technology, which is the paper cut solution, which we're able to, which teachers and staff members swipe in when they're looking to make copies and we're able to track numbers. So it's a good way to potentially eliminate waste. There's a real concern that um, these pieces of equipment are going to uh, die, for lack of a better term. Well, if you're doing over 300,000 pages a month, which seems incredible, um, then yeah, I would think they're getting worked pretty good. So when we look at um, replacing the copiers, printers, do we look at how we're actually using the equipment to make sure we're not buying more than we need or leasing more than we need it? Because we're yep. I'm thinking we're on Google Docs here a lot. Yep. So how much are we actually printing at this point? I'm sure we are. Yep. You know, but or copying. But is have we looked at can we reduce what we have? Yep, we did it. We had an audit done um, with one company and um, I spent a uh, couple of days do walking through all of the buildings and looking at all of the equipment and speaking to office managers and this was determined to be the number that was necessary um, for the district districts. I believe so. We haven't drafted the contract yet, but this is just, this hearing is to accept the revenue. Um, I would just urge that before we do that, that, yeah. that do an additional maybe comparison between the two vendors. What yeah. Cost per buy at the end. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah. So accepting the revenue, I mean, that's, this is still contingent upon a, on a contract. Is that essentially going forward with the recommendation for the uh, budget document technology? So it's more than just accepting the revenue. If we accept the revenue, that's the trigger to go Here and do. The but the action includes everything. Right, right. Um, it, I, uh, just a recommendation. I, I would have liked to have seen the proposal maybe explain kind of what you explained like you did the an audit here were the audit findings we're trying to do these here are our goals here's the solutions here's a cost where if we were to replace all the equipment it might be double what we're paying now that would make it a lot easier to um, say yes uh, looks like a good analysis we trust the results and without further discussion could just approve it and move on so it, it would be helpful uh, for stuff like this because it raised a lot of questions in my mind and I feel a little pressure like to say no would be to hinder our district in, in a need for want of additional information so I have to trust from a trust in you that you've done it right I don't I don't by default not trust you it's just it's, it's kind of the, the job here uh, on this side of the table to, um, to ask those questions and do that analysis so. can we split the two and come back to, a, to the lease part of it at another time when we have more information? I, I guess I would ask what more information you're looking for. So this is, um, this is a lot of work was done with the finance director and with the director of technology to put lots of information together. You can see there's two additional memos that are attached to this. So this is affecting the SEU, the Amherst School District and the Mount Vernon School District because Part of the reason we're able to, to have this competitive proposal is because we have additional buying power because we're combining all of the districts into one. So this will hold up a contract um, that we would like to get solidified prior to the end of the fiscal year. Uh, Can I what, go if there's what specific additional, questions? What is, is the two additional be, memos uh, in, in here? One's health trust and one's the page six, seven, and eight. Yep, there's a memo from. Um, oh. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not worried about the health trust or the truck. 
Am I no, there's information from um, the, the um, director six, of technology. Six, yes, the, me the memo, right, from Brian. The, yep. The two pager, the yep. three pager, yes. So, John, can I just ask to turn up, what is your concern? Well, I don't know what the cost is if we don't, if we, if we do what we've been doing and we replace our broken equipment with new equipment, is that prohibitively expensive? Thank Does that take our $46,248.75 annual outlay and triple it? Because that's the way it's going. So that would make these proposals look on the, on the memo like, oh, that's a no-brainer. So there's a, a piece of the analysis, which I, you must have done. I, I don't dispute that you probably did this audit and did all this work. It's just not reflected in the, in the two, two plus pages here. That's, that's all. That's all. I, I'm not trying to throw a hammer on this. I'm not trying to put it. No, I, I get it. I, th I, I think, the, you know, stop yeah. this from happening. It's just. And oh, I think an oversimplified metaphor for this might be um, if, if my family owns three cars and all three of them end their useful life at the same time, I can either, and I can afford to pay cash for one car one year, only one at a time. I can either buy one car a year for three years and not have two cars that I need for two years or lease all three and have them for that entire time. That's essentially what we've done here is we've not budgeted to replace our copiers for the past several years. We've replaced some with end of year funds, but we've not budgeted for the capital costs of buying new copiers. So this is the reason there's an increase in costs is because now we're, we're, capital, we're, we're buying new capital, we're buying new copiers. So instead of waiting for three years to get all the copiers that we need because we're behind, we're leasing them so we can get them all now and have what we need now. That's probably an oversimplification, but that's what we're doing. And we're in a default budget, so we don't have the extra to get around to get around Did I get it right, Amy? Is it? Okay. And so to build upon that, maybe we could take Anna's advice and say, hey, when we're replacing these at the end of the lease term, could you buy them back versus replace that? And then put that actually into our annual budget going forward. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they, we really should have been budgeting for copier um, replacement for the past however many years, and we haven't done that. So this is actually, it is a bit of a catch up, but um, I have heard repeatedly from staff all throughout the year that there is a, a desperate need for functioning equipment. Now, does this give us like a built-in capital fund? Because uh, at the end of the lease, if these, if these printers and copiers are functioning the way our printers and copies are, are functioning now, we just get them replaced. We just replace them with new ones and continue the lease without having that shock of a, a sudden capital investment. Yes. Exactly right. Yep. And having to, to pass a, a capital approval or a capital yeah. plan every right. year. Incremental cost right. increase if there's increases in cost of the copies, but not a drastic capital increase. Right. Yeah. So a couple things to think about. Are they going to aggregate all the copies between? I mean, so there's there, they can if they're budgeting for three hundred thousand a month, they can do that by copier. Or they yeah, everything is going to have to be by everything has to be by district. Okay, but they still and by building it within the district or within the building because what you don't want is one copier that's only using five thousand copies. And another one that's using 20,000 copies, yeah. and you'll get this, you'll get a huge extra bill, and, and they can aggregate it. You just have to make sure that you ask for that. And make yes, sure we have had that discussion with them. And then the other yep. thing is make sure, and it's going to be hard for people, but make sure that when the old printers are, you know, when the current toner is used up, they got to stop using them. Yes. Because everybody gets used to having them handy. And I know. You're going to get people who are like, I just need another toner cartridge. I know. Trading off that mm -hmm. cost here. Yeah. So they have to actually, you know, cut that cord and start printing on the copy. And we've had conversations um, with providing some training for staff. So that has been um, a topic. I, yeah. I quickly looked at the GASB statement number 87, and it requires, I think, both the lessor and lessee to capitalize the equipment individually. You can't aggregate them, if, if I read it correctly. But it's for the overage charge. Like you get a charge each month, right. like, okay, your lease for this machine is 
$249, but you went over on your copies for that machine because they're providing the toner. They're usually providing the toner and service as part of the lease. Toner and service are not part of the lease, according to this statement, correct? Yeah, it's separate. So I think they'll still charge you extra if you go over that. I could be wrong, but check that. Yep. So it's just to it's just to keep make sure the copies, the copy number doesn't have a spike on it. This contract will be reviewed by our IT director, our finance director. It will go through legal and perhaps even accounting. So our accounts. So it will be thoroughly vetted. <laughs> okay. Any last questions? What happens if we don't accept this offer? I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm going to vote for it, but I'm just a little curious logistically. What happens if we don't? It, it goes to fund balance, um, but I would have to review because it. Potentially affects the other districts and the, and the contract that were that we discussed with the vendor, the Amherst School District and Mount Vernon, um, and Vernon, yeah, Amherst and Mount Vernon have both accepted the but revenue. Even like for the trust, so if we if we said no on the trust fund, it's yeah, I like to find the money <laughs> for the budget. Yeah, it just means that the budget doesn't get the benefit of having those funds offset and expense. That's, so we still get the revenue. The revenue is still coming to us. Okay. It just doesn't get to be repurposed, offset, and expense that we're spending, which means another part of the budget has to has to be identified to cover that expense. Okay. So then it becomes excess Correct. at the end because there's nowhere Correct. it can be used. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. You got it. Any other questions? Okay. Can I... Uh, have a motion to accept the unanticipated revenue from health trust sales vehicle and the copiers. And Abby, Anna <laughs> seconds. Um, all those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Not opposed? All right, that passes. Thank you. I know the staff is very appreciative. Thank you for your hard work on the research on that. Appreciate it. Okay, so we'll officially. Do we want to do the three separate motions? Yeah, we do. Because there's three suggested motions in there. Uh, I, you know, I kind of. Yeah, we said the health trust. We have to accept yeah. the vehicle. So, we want to do? Should we do each motion separately? Yeah, so I'll make a motion to accept and expend 164,744.92 from the return of surplus from the health trust. This fund shall be accepted into the general fund for fiscal year 22. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Pim seconds. Those in favor of raise your hand. Those opposed. That one's accepted. Great. I make a motion to accept and expend forty-five thousand one hundred from the sale of the vehicle. These funds will be accepted into the general fund for fiscal year twenty-three. Motion. Pim seconds. Uh, just hold on. Did, is that twenty-three or twenty-two? I thought I heard you say twenty-two in your. The yeah, the first one's 22, the second one's 23. Well, it's written 23, but I thought Amy said 22 when she was giving her introduction. Just want to make sure that's... Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, so put that in 22. Typo yeah. in the document. Right. The motion needs... I'll make a motion to amend FY22. <laughs> to, uh, for FY22. Thank you. Okay. Need a second. The motion. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'll second the motion. Okay. Thank you. Dan seconds the motion. Those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Third motion. Motion to accept and expend $7,000 from the sale of the existing copier equipment. These funds shall be accepted into the general fund for fiscal year 22? 23. 23. 23. <laughs> <laughs> Pim seconds. Those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Okay. Those have passed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving into our agenda, public input section, one of two. If anyone would like to uh, approach the table, you'll have to press the button. When you do, please say your name and where you're from, and you'll have approximately three minutes to speak. Hi, Lisa Eastland, Amherst. I just want to let you all know about some progress of project graduation and how that's going. Um, if anybody would like to help volunteer or um, any of that kind of stuff, it is going to be held June 3rd, Friday night. 
from 9.30 till 12. If it's nice, it'll be outside. If it isn't, we'll be inside. Um, so if anybody wants to come help and volunteer, that would be great. We will also be set up at the Senior Project Exhibition, doing a little welcome table, helping people find out where they need to go, and also connecting with seniors and senior parents about Project Rescue. Um, and last, I just wanted to thank Wendy True and all of her people for hosting a lovely prom committee, doing the whole all their committees and stuff. Um, my kid went, said it was great, I had a great time. So thank you, Mike. Thank you to Wendy. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Seeing no one approach the microphone, we will move on. Um, the first part of our presentation is the audit presentation. Am I doing an introduction at all? Or are we? Oh, sorry. Yep, thank you. So tonight we have uh, Mike Campo from. Uh, Plotstick and Sanderson to present the FY21 audit for the Sohegan Cooperative School District. Good evening, everyone. I feel like I'm spending half of my uh, year in this building. <laughs> um, I joke. I actually, as I have said in the other meetings, I do enjoy the opportunity to be able to review with the board members the audit process. A lot goes into it. Uh, your particular audit has about six or seven different people who have their hands in it from the start to finish. So to be able to present it and go over it is a, is a nice treat. I don't always get to do that. So we'll dive right in. Um, as I've done in the other ones, I'll run through some of the highlights of the audit report. If you guys have questions, by all means, stop me. And at the end, I'll give you a chance to follow up with additional questions. So going to pages one and two. This is why you, uh, this letter right here is essentially why you bring in an audit firm. You're looking for the opinion of an independent auditor audit firm to be able to indicate whether or not your financial statements are clearly stated in all material respects. I'm pleased to share with you that you have the highest opinion possible, an unmodified opinion, and that we could conclude that when we went through your financial statements, they are in fact uh, clearly stated in all material respects. And what does that mean? If you were able to go to the bank and look for borrowing, you were just talking about copiers, one of the things they're going to ask you for if you're getting a lease is your audit report. And they want to see this. They don't want to see one where they just can't rely on the financial statement. So, in that sense, your district is doing a great job. Page 41. And we're actually going to look at page 41, 42, and 43. It really just breaks down the performance of the general fund over the past year. And you can see that overall, your revenues came in higher than anticipated by about 330000 Going to page 42. Your appropriation, your expenditures versus appropriations were under by roughly 800,000. I, I will quickly interject on that point. That's been pretty consistent across the state. I think with all the impacts of COVID, uh, some, some money has been saved. A lot of it has to do with staffing. When you can't find people to fill jobs, you still need to budget for the position, but you're gonna see savings there. And then on page 43, you see a nice, nice breakdown of where you started with your fund balance at the start of the year and how it ended. And you do see it, it has grown over the past year. Again, there's been a lot of extra funding coming in, whether it's donations, and uh, the bigger factor is really the, the cost savings, whether it be not being able to find. A, a typical issue that we've seen is that bus drivers are really tough to come by. And that alone is a pretty big savings. And then teachers as well, and babies. Going back to page 14, here this is just basically the last three schedules put together in one clean, real quick look at it. And again, your ending was just shy at 1.1 million in unsigned fund balance. I'm going to now have you take a look at the letter to those charge of governance. It's a second document than a smaller one. I just wanted to quickly re, um, review the, the comments, recommendations we have for it. Uh, first one, student activity deposits. We just found that uh, for the South Eagan School District that they weren't being done consistently on a weekly basis. We recommend that best practices are that they were deposited at least once a week. Food service deposit. The school district has a policy in which the kitchen manager is supposed to review and sign off on the deposit. 
that we found was not happening consistently, and we recommend that that policy be, be followed. It is a school district policy. Scale data checks, this is not uncommon, um, but it's still something that should be a, addressed. Uh, we found that there were several checks that were dated of uh, a period of 90 days or older as of June 30th. So we would recommend that taking the time with the treasurer and starting to get those out. And then the final comment we had was, and again, it's not all that uncommon, but it's still something we want to bring to your attention, the, the disbursement of funds out of the student activity fund without proper documentation. Um, I understand the need sometimes to get something done quickly, especially when you're dealing at the high school level. It still requires the appropriate documentation be retained and renewed. So with that, I'm happy to go through the report in as much detail as you want, but I also know that you don't find it as entertaining as I do. <laughs> so uh, I, if anyone has questions, I'm, I'm here to answer them. Anyone has questions? <clears throat> I, I got questions mostly for um, for maybe Adam and Amy. What steps are we taking to make sure that we're remedying those those findings? Yep. So I can address each of them. So the student activities deposits. Um, my understanding is that COVID certainly impacted that, um, but we have rectified that by obtaining a digital scanner to process deposits remotely. So we believe that that will um, certainly mitigate that issue. For the food service deposit slips, we have discussed this with the kitchen manager, um, the importance of signing off on all slips and ensuring that deposits are made in a timely manner, manner um, and our food service director will also be helping us with that um, to ensure that that happens. Um, for the stale data checks, um, the treasurer and business office periodically review those. We do have um, something called positive pay that matches checks that the district issues with those that are presented for payment. And um, we feel that it, with that, it's unlikely we'd lose track of these items. The checks are also um, uh, labeled with a void after I believe it's either 60 or 90 days. Um, we agree certainly that the um, student activities disbursements need to be supported with proper documentation uh, we've discussed this issue with office staff to ensure that our established best practices are followed. So we have taken steps to discuss the issues with the folks that need, it, need to be discussed, and we've also implemented some other um, mitigation processes. Great. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna? I was going to say, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that the checks are going to be deposited sooner. Um, I was surprised to see that the standard was a week for a student activity check because I will say in my own checkbook, they're the ones that are usually like three months outstanding. And I just, I just know they're there. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that'll get eventually. And it does, but there, there's probably, I mean, it can't be just me and it, it predated COVID. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad and I appreciate that that's going to get taken care of. We, we've had um, some turnover in staff as well, which is also um, presented some challenges. So there was actually today, there was a, a training of office staff done by our director of finance during late start. So we're hoping to provide them with the, the necessary tools they need to, to um, keep to our best practices. Any other questions? No, I actually have one and it's really not a material, huge material one, but it is a question I have. Um, on your notes to the financial statements under note one, the last one, note the P, the material change in classification, it says the food service fund, which accounts for operations of school, school districts, food service firms, did not qualify as a major fund for the current fiscal year. So it's, can you explain that? Like, Yeah, so based on a calculation of assets, revenues, expenditures, liabilities, if you break 5% of the total, if a fund breaks 5% of the total, so when you put okay. them all together, it would be identified as a major fund. Okay. So what happened this year was, and I don't know which category it was, but one of those categories triggered that it was re reflected as a major fund. All that means is for reporting purposes is that it ends up with its own materiality in terms of testing. So instead of being part of the aggregate mm -hmm. remaining funds, it ends up with its own. So it'll wow. a lot, often when you see one go from the remaining aggregate to an individual fund, it ends up with a lower threshold mm -hmm. because it's now standing alone and not collecting the same uh, asset or revenue value. 
So that's all. It's really for reporting purposes. It gets shown in Schedule C1 and C3 as its own column, mm -hmm. whereas all the other non-major funds are reported in the aggregate. Okay. Yeah, that's why I was trying to understand how that. No, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a new disclosure of that one this year. Okay. It's been going on for a long time, but it's never been laid out like that before. So that's that explains that why it showed up there. This year. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Any other questions? Oh. Mike, that's it. Thanks so Thank much. You Short and Have sweet. Nice Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so the next we have is the presentation on the mentoring program from two of our faculty members. If you'd come up and introduce yourselves for everyone. And don't forget to press the green button. Good evening. How are you? Good. Well, thanks for having us this evening. Um, my name is Travis Mason. I'm a ninth grade English teacher here at Southern Union. And Kim Bonilla. I teach 10th grade English here. And both Kim and I are the new staff program facilitators this year. And um, we'll spend a couple minutes just chatting with you about what it is that we do in our program. Um, this is the first year that we've implemented it as facilitators. So we've certainly had a lot of time to reflect and about implications for future years, and we'd like to talk about maybe some of our reflections and our work, and then we'll close with answering questions that that you all might have for us. Yeah. So we wanted to start with kind of why we're in this role and why we think it's important, and it'll be really crucial for South Asian or any people really. Um, but I started working here 11 years ago when I was 23, fresh out of college. I was working part time here in the annex. And it was really hard for me to acclimate to South Asian culture. There's a lot of traditions and like sort of ways of doing things, and I was also really young. And I struggled. I felt like I could have needed a little bit more structure and support in teaching, um, but also just in kind of working in a new environment. And so when Travis told me about this um, facilitator position, I was like, yes, I definitely want to do that um, as a way to pay it forward. But also, I Last year, I finished my career growth um, and I looked at organizational psychology and the research really talks about the importance of onboarding in an organization and how important new staff members are um, because they're really an investment for the future. And a lot of times, I think people view like new staff as, you know, oh, like sort of acting like our culture versus really looking at new staff as, as a strength, as like something that can make our school better. So that's why I, um, my experiences with this back here is, is different than Kim's because I was a teaching intern um, and I left and worked in another district and had the opportunity to come back and when I did come back as a full-time staff member I had already learned through my internship some of the norms and the values that existed amongst the current faculty and it was easier for me to naturally navigate some of those and not break any of them as I as I made some professional relationships with my colleagues. But um, as Kim mentioned, the, the reason why we're both doing this is because we know from our experience this year and through what research tells us that being a new staff member at any school, South Asian high school included, is is difficult. It's hard. Um, you know, we have a, a really veteran staff here and as I mentioned, long-standing unspoken norms exist, and we want to make sure that we can help our new staff members navigate that culture. Um, mainly because we we feel as if for school improvement, if our objective is to enhance and improve instruction, finding really highly qualified new staff members who can do that is, is key. They're the ones who are really facilitating those improvements in the classrooms for our students. And we want to ensure that you know we acquire them, but can we sustain them? We help develop them and ensure that they stay here for a long time and that we can invest in their skills if we regard them as, as highly qualified. We certainly want them to remain and stay here. Um, did I miss anything? Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we ran the program this year. So we met once a month. Uh, we had a new staff kind of meeting in the summer. But we met, met once a month, but initially we wanted to meet with both mentors and mentees. And then we started to sort of adjust our meetings based on the needs of the group and what people felt like they needed. So some meetings we just met with mentees and others we met with mentors to kind of 
your feedback on how things are going, how the transition is going, what they needed, as well as sort of follow up one-on-one -on -one conversations that you have with team staff and mentors. Because both I think need to be supported in the program, not just the new staff, but the people who are helping them as well. Um, throughout that process, we've tried to collect as much feedback and data from both mentors and new staff members as possible to help us inform like what the future of this program looks like and how we act as facilitators of the program and um, some some really key takeaways that we've had between the, the seven or eight months that we've been in this role as Kim, as Kim mentioned it's really important that we provide as much support for the teacher mentors the, the veteran teachers who are assigned to work with the new staff member um, just as much as we provide support for the new staff members themselves mentoring is a really big undertaking um, it requires a lot of professional learning and skill building and emotional instruction and coaching it requires facilitators to be or mentors to be effective facilitators and knowing how to work with staff members who might be dealing with some really internal conflicts with themselves or with their practice or with their experience as they navigate the new school so um, we'd like to provide and facilitate as as program runners some professional learning for, for our future mentors so they feel supported in that process. Um, we also think that relation, relationship building at the onset of this program when we meet new staff members in the summer is also incredibly important. Um, research shows that relational trust throughout a whole organization can be the like, unspoken abstract element that makes conflict a little easier. Um, and if we can very early in that process coach people to feel vulnerable and to be open with one another, when conflicts eventually arise throughout the school year, our new staff members feel as if they have supports in place where they can have those conversations with people in a really safe, um, high relational trust environment. Um, and then that's really kind of the implication for us moving forward in the program. We know that we'll continue to acquire new staff members as as our current staff retires and as we induct new members, and we want to make sure that in our goal to improve our school and improve our instructional practices, those highly qualified staff members that we hire and bring on feel supported throughout their first few years at the school. And that's all that's all we have. So we, we'd love to hear your questions and, and answer as many as we can and we'll just open it up and have a, a, a conversation if you want. Okay. Anna, questions? So, I, I, Come a series of questions. Is that okay? Uh, so, what, what was? I'm curious. So, what was the genesis of this? Is this something you came up with? Where did it Where did it come from? I think it's wonderful, but I'm, I'm curious where it came from. Um, in, in previous years, we had a, a new staff program, but it was it was very informal. Mm -hmm. um, new staff were assigned a mentor. Venture staff members were asked to be mentors, and then that was kind of it. You you kind of I have trust that the mentors and new staff are meeting with frequency throughout the year and that there was connection being established between them. But the process was never formalized to this extent with monthly meetings or um, you know, individuals within the staff who could serve as points of contact between mentors and new staff and you know, central office or uh, school leadership or school administration. So um, I was approached by Christine Langwell at the end of last school year to kick this program off the ground and then um, I brought on Kim because her career growth project as she mentioned is around organizational psychology and she had some really nice expertise that that helped this program be the level of success that it was this year. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, when, you know, when you said you did this last year with the new teachers, mm -hmm. was that new teachers just this year or did you go back a year or two? Because I imagine the assimilation process was extra hard for anyone who came in mm -hmm. like right before you know COVID and you know if you're new and not involved and then I guess the, the second part of that is is there a summer thing or anything for the support staff and if there was if not is there thought about maybe including them to answer your first question it was just new staff for this year although we did gather some data um, at the tail end of this year going as far back as five years maybe just to kind of see if there were any trends in um, the onboarding process or any feedback that they could give us so we did collect that 
Um, and then a second question was about, is it, is it just for teachers or, or is there a program, does it include support staff and or has there been any thought of expanding it out to include support staff? It doesn't include support staff right now, but I think if there is such a funding goal, then it's going to be the whole school and the camp, but I don't, I don't know about the increases of pay and that. Right, that was part of the But I think if I can put a plug in for a support staff, that would be, they would love that. Yeah. You know, and, and support staff, I think, don't get enough support themselves in their jobs and in their professional growth. So I imagine, I mean, they're navigating these same traditions and, mm -hmm. you know, all that that everyone else is going through. Mm -hmm. Dan? I just want to say I think it's great because I think one of the biggest um, factors in success and satisfaction and retention, not just in staff and employees, is, but in students, is having the relationships within the, the organization. And I think it goes, it plays well with the anchoring adult mm -hmm. plan. And you know, you kind of extend it to the staff and that helps bring them in and establish those relationships that you, are, you said were important. I agree. I can start with relationships too. Right. You know, to not start with the work right away, which I think sometimes we tend to do, I tend to do that too. It's like, all right, let's start the meeting, right? Instead of being like, who are you? You know, who am I working with right <laughs> exactly. now? Exactly. I can that now. Tim? Um, also love the program. I think it's great. So appreciate both of you guys jumping into that. Um, overall feedback, uh, how, how has that been? Um, has it been primarily stressful? I think so, but you know, I'm sure you can um, come up, tell us exactly what has felt been like, and also if you have any examples of you know, changes that have been made within some areas for improvement. Good question. Um, the feedback has been varied. It's very nuanced depending on on the new staff member. We, we try to keep it as anonymous as possible so that people would feel comfortable being as honest in the feedback as they could. Um, I think one trend, and Kim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, has been um, there are times where we'll have both mentors and new staff members meet together at the same time. And then there are other times where we'll split and Kim might facilitate a meeting with just the mentors and I might facilitate a meeting with just the new staff members. Um, and, and feedback has been nice uh, from both parties, I think, just to have meetings with themselves, because again, this is tricky work. Um, and it's almost been a, a community of practice where these people, new staff members, are having these shared experiences that they can talk about in an open forum together and empathize, sympathize, again, be vulnerable, and collectively work towards some solutions with what they're grappling with. And it sounds like in some instances, the mentors can also have that same kind of process when they have that structured meeting time that didn't exist in the previous version of this program. Um, and then to your, to your question about like specific areas of improvement, I think something that that Kim just alluded to is when we started this program in the summer and we had our official newcomers day with new staff and mentors, we jumped right into the work for the most part, talking about the layout of the school, and some of the specific you know, pieces of South Eden that make our school unique, like some of the projects for Division One, and sometimes that's information overload like when you're a new staff member and spending more time on connection building and establishing relationships and trust maybe would have been a better use of our time, and then we could have introduced some of this to South Eden Health and some of the staff actors. Great, I mean, I would imagine somebody coming into this environment would have an idea of some of those things, you know, um, mm -hmm. but obviously not as detailed and goes into it, so I, I like uh, that improvement area that you're talking about. That was great, thanks. Yeah. I'll echo the praise, that sounds perfect. Um, is it just one year? for the mentor-mentee, a formal relationship under your program, just for the first year? Yes. Yeah. Um, and since it's the first year, I, well, I guess the question is, would you be tracking, maybe informally, checking in, following up, like do those people stay connected um, uh, for a longer period of time? Does the does it become uh, like, oh, if I have a question, I'm just gonna call my, my, men, my mentor because that's who I've kind of started with. Uh, it might become a de facto, our relationship. Are, 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 are
I guess we'll see. I mean, I could I could see it, but um, that's the hope, right? Well, well, yeah, because kind of to your point about being vulnerable. I mean, it's easy when everything's nice and everything's smooth and everything's running well. That you have an issue, maybe it's a personal issue, professional issue, struggling with something, it can be difficult to just talk with your colleagues who you don't really have a deep connection with, um, and to have a, have someone you feel comfortable going to, you know, could really ward off a lot of uh, deeper problems. I think so. Um, Anyway, great job. Thank you. Can I just add one, yes, one thing? Right, uh, uh, both Kim and Travis have, have done really well of creating a, a comfortable and, and approachable environment. I think uh, they've been very uh, diplomatic and polite. They've, they've dealt with some, some heavy things, you know, as transitioning and working through last year into this year and some of the, the things that happened. And so uh, I don't think they give themselves enough credit on, on how they've kind of case managed the different, you know, um, you know, incidents and people issues that we might have encompassed over the last two years. And you kind of caught some of it this year. And so I think uh, they've done, they're both very interested in this. They care about it for their own personal reasons. They care about it for the, you know, for, for South Hegan, but I think they care about the profession of education and they've created that. And, um, it's a really valuable program, and, and I don't think they've really given themselves enough credit on on the 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 climate they've created in their building because they they are privy to to a lot of information that I might not be privy, and they will be able to kind of use their relationship with the administration for for guidance to be able to handle some things, but by remaining confidential. So it's a real sophisticated balance that be, as they kind of work in this role and. Uh, at the end of the day, because of the uniqueness, it is not easy to assimilate to, to South Hegan High School. It's a unique public high school with a lot of hidden traditions and unspoken, you know, ways of operating. And so you can be a very solid instructor and new person. And this is not just for first year teachers. This could this someone could be in their 11th year and come in and, and they're in this and you still have to transition. And so uh, they've done really well at, at, at managing that and uh and so i just you know I, I think it's a valuable program i like the way they've kind of run with it with steve and christine and uh they're very professional how they go about it so i hope they stay involved in it in their roles because they've created a good a, a good culture around it so. yeah that's fantastic to hear i i love it i knew there was a mentoring program here but you've guys taken it to a a whole new level and it's great to see that you know helping those the teachers that are new to our community are given a, a chance to to get to work with somebody and get that balance so that's fantastic so thank you so much for all your hard work um if you had to say there's one piece of support you need that you don't have right now to make this program even a notch better is there anything summer days <laughs> if I'm being honest, mm -hmm. um, we had one day this summer to cover a lot of ground in a couple of hours. Okay. And it was a lot for new staff. We would love to just slow it down a little bit with new staff. You know, they did our newcomers, they did the district newcomers. Um, they didn't get paid for that, I believe, right? Mentees did not. Um, I'm not asking for much money, but I just think it's time that we can slow it down and, and really put both sides of that tension okay. into it. Thank you. Okay, time is very important. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, you know, appreciate you taking the time this evening and please go home and rest. <laughs> thank you. Um,
So before we move on to JFAC, I had one request to move up our discussion about the food service so we can also get somebody else sent home who's been working all day long. Yes. Um, so Crystal, if you would like to come forward and introduce yourself, because I think most of us have not met you yet, um, but we're going to move to the nutrition services update that's actually at the very end. So before Crystal introduces herself, I just want to um, to say that in the short time that Crystal has been with us, just since early December, she has truly had um, an impact on all of the districts, including Sohegan, and has done an exceptional job of tracking our uh, revenues and expenditures and being able to, to um, provide me with really excellent financial reporting so that we can make course adjustments, um, recognize where issues are, and um, and and it it is you will see it is having a real impact in terms of our um, our surplus or not surplus in Sohegan, but our our better um, projections for the end of the year. So she's going to give you an update on some of the work she's been doing, um, some information on the financials, and information on the actual food service program. Um, and some communications that she's worked hard to get out to our community so that folks are staying informed. So, thank you. Yep. Um, also, one note for the piece of information about the deposits from the auditor um, deposits for all food service are collected on Friday afternoon and not to people's bank um, since I started in December. So, I go around on Friday afternoon. Um, I believe at South Hegan, um, our shop manager, Mark, he drives right past the bank, so sometimes he'll bring it, but most, you know, sometimes I bring it as well, but it's a hard one Friday is deposit day, <laughs> so, um, but thank you for having me tonight. Um, I just wanted to go over a few highlights. When I first started in December, we were projected to have a deficit of around $92,000 for Service. So those funds would have had to be transferred from the general fund to cover those uh, that deficit. Right now, with working with um, the staff and our chef manager, Mark, as well as the higher participation rate um, due to universal team meals, that deficit now looks somewhere around the $11,000 mark. I'm hoping that since this memo was created, it, um, a few weeks ago and getting more projections and and really working with mark i hope that number um, we're fairly confident it will be around the five thousand dollar mark give or take um so breaking even is always great but hopefully we'll get there in the future <laughs> um so the reasons why that that's a, such a huge gap like i said the higher participation rate due to the universal free lunches as well as um, the reimbursement rate changes. So we're getting per meal per student who gets a reimbursable meal, $4.56 for our lunch, and I believe $2.60 for breakfast. So before universal free meals, um, the information that I gathered from the kitchen staff, we were serving about maybe a third to half of the students that we're serving now. Our a la carte sales were much higher, um, but now I believe that the, because of the universal free meal, uh, families are really taking advantage of that. Um, and also I've been working with Mark and Mark has been wonderful at really saving costs with purchasing. That is definitely one of his strengths. We have weekly conversations about that. And um, just a shout out to the kitchen staff. Um, I spent some time with them. Um, and they really give the students here a array of different varieties. And the climate of the cafeteria is awesome in my opinion. You don't see this in many other um, high school settings in the state. The high top tables, having an open, um, 
open kitchen hours, so if a student is hungry or thirsty any part of the day, they can come down, grab a snack or anything. Like that is huge. It especially helps our revenue line too. Um, because otherwise we would, if that time wasn't available to students, we'd have to turn them away. Um, and also the kitchen staff makes a lot from scratch here. I don't think that's recognized a lot. Um, they make their own fresh salsa, sauces, um, even dressings too for the salads. So um, instead of just purchasing those in, which would be a higher cost, they're utilizing the ingredients we already have in house. Um, let me see what else I want to show you. So going along with those reimbursement rates, outside of those that revenue, so far just in sales, a la carte sales and extra revenue for a small amount of catering that we've done, we have gotten almost $124,000 in sales. So that has definitely helped um, that gap, that bridge that gap from the 92,000 deficit to closer to about, I'm hoping we can get it back. Um, I also want to talk about the communications that I've sent out. Um, I talked to the principal as well as um, our kitchen manager about what happens when a student graduates or when a student moves. What happens to their lunch account? So uh, at the beginning of this week, when we returned from April vacation, all senior parents got a letter um, helping them and informing them on how to navigate that balance. They were given three options. Um, they could either donate any surplus funds they had to another family who maybe is having a hard economic time. They could request a refund, which will be um, issued at the end of the school year. Um, or if there was another sibling in the district, then we could transfer those funds to, the, um, to their sibling as well. So then we don't have this extra surplus of funds that we don't know what to do with, or we have to try to track people down when they've been out of the district for a few years. Um, I also sent a generalized um, communication to all district parents helping navigate next year. Um, as of right now, universal free meals will be ending at the end of this school year, and we'll be going back to um, a paid lunch system. So what does that mean? That means that families um, should apply for the free or reduced uh, lunch program. It's income-based. It helps not only offset and bring in the revenue for the kitchen, but it also helps fund um, projects like Title I and other um, projects for the community as well. So it's very important that those families um, in our community fill that form out and send it back in. Um, they, I also had talked to families about if they are planning on moving or leaving the district to touch base with myself about what to do with any um, funds in their child's lunch account or any negative balance they might have to pay that balance off before moving on to another district. That's, that's great, yeah. And I would just add from a um, finance standpoint, the FY22 budget included over a $41,000 uh, projected transfer from the general fund to offset uh, uh, a deficit in food service and to be at um, hopefully between five and 10,000 or so is a tremendous accomplishment. And um, a lot of that is attributed to the work that Crystal has done and the work with the staff. So um, she's, she's really done a great job. Um, and the only other thing I was gonna add was, um, oh, did you wanna just touch base on the, the commodities and the fresh fruit and vegetables? So um, we are utilizing our full um, commodity budget. And I set aside about $500 of that budget to be used in our fresh fruit and vegetables program 
It's a program that hasn't been utilized in, across all of our districts before. Um, so we started off with just a small amount of money for that to allocate those funds, just to help bring in different types of fruits and vegetables that maybe uh, students weren't necessarily exposed to, or also helping to get away from just serving a lot of canned fruit um, as well. So they'll be um, offset that cost of the, the fresh fruit and vegetables. And if it's a hit, then we can allocate more of those funds in the future. This is a, um, every year we get allotted a certain amount of money from the DOE and we can pick and choose to some extent what we'd like to bring in um, for commodity and food. Um, so taking a po portion of that budget was really important to me to bring in more fresh fruit and vegetables for our, um, for our students. A uh, quick question with regards to inflation. How is that impacting your purchases for next year? So that is a tough, it is a tough part in my, um, I, it is going to be one of our four, one of my top, top priorities, really looking at how our managers are setting up their menus, utilizing products we have in-house and shopping around. Um, inflation has gone up so much that, um, you can really see it in our um, menu costs. I started to break those down with Amy as well in getting a cost by meal. So just from tracking from December to um, December until current, at the high school level, our cost per meal has gone up almost 10 cents just in the purchasing, not in our labor line and um, other overhead expenses that I have to take a look into, but just the cost itself, it, it is rising. So I think it, we need to just make smart purchasing decisions and menu um, creation definitely to help that. Um, at the end of the day, our students do need to be fed and I wanna make sure that they are fed healthy, nutritious meals. That, um, I, my philosophy is the students coming into our school, they're coming into my home and they'll eat how they're coming into my home, you know, with the, obviously with regards to the nutrition um, guidelines that we have to follow, but they just have to um, have their purchases in school and stuff so we can work yeah. around it and maybe not offer higher end things every day, um, but maybe like once or twice a month. Because I noticed when you put in the potential reimbursement rates um, for going through the end of uh, this year with the increases, has there been any talk about seeing an increased number there as well in terms of the reimbursement rate? Right now, I don't have those numbers. Okay. Um, it has been, so in the directors across the state, it is yeah. a buzz right now of what the uncertainty is next year. Okay. What the reimbursement rate is going to look like. Is that going to go down to where we used to be pre-COVID or is it going to um, increase because of all the other factors around that, like the inflation, cost of goods rising, and all the overhead expenses rising too. Um, I don't have the correct information to speak to that at, okay. at this moment. Thank you. It is definitely a fourth thought. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Crystal and I, um, we meet weekly and talk about uh, possibilities for next year, and we've we've started to develop a model for um, what would it look like if we were to, if the waiver were to be extended. Although it's not looking good at all at this point, um, so we're looking at any adjustments that we need to make in terms of, as she was saying, meal costs, purchasing, mm -hmm. labor costs, all of that. Mm -hmm. So we have we have a draft of a um, of a model for that for next year. Okay. Just so that we're prepared yeah. um, because a few months ago, we, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. No one did, whether we were going to stay with universal free lunches or if the um, state or Congress USA would um, choose to go back to our normal paid lunches. Okay, I just got one more follow-up. In terms of debit balances, what uh, do we know what percentage of kids still have a debit balance on their account? So, Chris, I have hard numbers for that. I okay. don't have 
percentage. I don't have those with me, but I oh, okay. can certainly share those with you. Is it a sizable number? Or? I actually, so when I, yes. when I first okay. started, actually you have it. When I first started, um, we were across the district. Um, it was we a big were number. $10,000 deficit um, in negative balances. Um, across all of the district. students and staff. Chalkegan wasn't too bad, mm -hmm. um, but we have definitely, we've collected over $3,000. So now we're about, I believe when they ran the numbers last week, we're about $6,500 um, okay. negative. So we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. And I, I think that was because lack of communication as well um, in the past. We, I send out weekly um, balance reminders to families, um, both on, on two separate um, systems, so on my school bus and then directly to our CLS system. Okay. School. So that way we can capture any households that maybe are lacking information on either one of those um, servers, if you will. Thank you. Dan, I think, had... Okay. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for being here. It's been really informative. Um, you mentioned that we used to rely heavily on revenue from the a la carte side. Mm -hmm. How do you see the mix of the when the universal free lunches go away? Do you, do you think that's become a habit that they'll keep purchasing those lunches? I or that how does that, that affect revenue when you're... I, I believe hmm. that the a la carte sales will be increased and the a la carte sales will be um, universal free meals go away. I think the families and the students are getting the lunch option. Um, and also, you think that they would normally purchase. Um, so if I could back up and just give you a quick scenario. In the high school, we have a daily menu meal. Then we also offer slices of pizza, a chicken sandwich, um, and a burger salad. So in order to um, make that a meal, you need to have the student, when they take that, what's their main component, they need to take a fruit or a vegetable, at least a, one fruit or a vegetable. Um, and then it's considered a reimbursable meal. So it's free for the student. So they could have any combination of what's available. Um, previously, they would tell me to grab a slice of pizza, or grab a burger, or grab a chicken sandwich, and not make it a meal, because they would just, they just won't have to pay for the fruit. Does that make sense? Or pay for the whole meal? They would just purchase the one item. So then that would be an out of purchase. Mm -hmm. And will I explain that correctly? Yeah. And does that does that hurt the deficit or help? You know, how does that affect the? I believe that that would really have to depend more on diving into our purchase numbers and our reimbursement rates. How much are we getting for a cost? So it's. Right now, our cost per lunch, a uh, full meal is at the high school level is about a dollar thirty-six, I believe, was the last. Um, so we'd have to take an actual physical cost of what a uh, individual slice of pizza would cost, which actually I believe is about seventy-two cents, or a um, or a chicken sandwich, and then see how much we're charging and see compare the reimbursement rate what we were getting for the reimbursement rate, how much is left over after the cost versus just the raw cost of the burger plus the, you know, the sales price. The new school lunches can be so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Anna? I just wanted to thank you for the communication part because I've had so my, I have a senior, and so she's the last one who, through my exchange student, who will be aging out of the process. Mm -hmm. And I think the first time I just I called someone at my school box, I was like, can I like transfer this? Mm -hmm. What do I do? The second one, I got an email like at the start of the year saying, by the way, you still have money? You want to move it to the sister's account? I'm like, yeah, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. And this is all predating you, mm -hmm. so it was it was really nice to get that email the other day and be like, oh, there's actually a plan. Yeah. And then even on the, um, I was glad to hear you say that you're sending out the reminders when the accounts are passed in. Because, I, again, you know, my daughter presumably when she checks out her stuff gets told she has a past due, but I know there was a time in the fall she came up and she's like, 
mom, you know, I'm negative this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> why didn't you tell me? And why are they continuing to give you food? <laughs> you know? Um, and so I, it's fine. I get on and I pay. But, you know, certainly would have done that sooner if there had been that communication. And then I just set up for the auto to get it. But I understand that that's not always an option for people. And also, um, prior, the students were allowed to charge whatever they wanted. So it could have been an a la carte purchase or anything. That stopped. Um, a student cannot go into the negative for an a la carte purchase. So if they don't have the funds to purchase a drink or a snack or anything that's not a meal, they cannot go in the negative because of that. Ooh, right now it doesn't. Definitely a la carte. Yeah, ne next, I mean, this year it's a little different because a, a student can't go into the negative for a meal. Um, we cannot deny a student a meal, regardless of their funds, if they're how negative they are. Um, and we cannot discriminate as what they thought. So, you know, old school, they get a summer and jelly or cheese stamp, we cannot do that anymore. So whatever is offered as a daily menu meal, regardless of the financial situation at home, um, the, the child will get a meal at school. Okay, John? Yeah. Um I think it's a good idea here on one of your bullets to um, encourage parents, regardless of financial status, to fill out the free and reduced lunch application. Um, however, did you would you provide the the guidance so that a family in the privacy of their own home can can evaluate their situation and test their their um, uh, whether or not they would be uh, you know accepted into the program before actually submitting the application. My guidance for regard, uh, sending in the free and reduced application regardless of income um, was to really try to um, negate the negative stigma towards the free and reduced lunch application program and process. Um, that's why I attached it to the email itself. It can be found on our district website. So a student doesn't have to return it directly to school with them, a parent could discreetly send it through the mail if they weren't comfortable going that route. So they, a, a family doesn't have to sign up. I just wanted to make sure that our students were for, um, taken care of for next year because if right now for the past um, year and a half, two years, we've been universal free meals. So we haven't had to send in any, a, a family hasn't had to send in a free and reduced application but when we go to step the page next year, the student will have to pay. And if they can't, there's no grace period because they haven't submitted mm -hmm. their application. If they submit their application now, they'll have a 30-day grace period um, until the middle of October, I believe, um, where the family will have some time in the beginning of the school year, next school year, to um, resubmit their application. So the student will either have a reduced status or free status if they qualify. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, just to echo everyone else and not take up too much time, I, I appreciate the, the presentation. It's very informative. And thanks for your good work. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Crystal. Awesome. Thank, thank you for spending the time you. and really do appreciate all the communications. Awesome. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay, so the next big thing on our agenda is the JPAC discussion. And I asked um, Victoria and Shannon to make sure they were here, and I think they brought Brian along <laughs> if he's here to help. Um, but it comes from the last SAU meeting when we said, when they were saying, what do we want JFAC to be? And I was like, well, you know what? We haven't had a discussion at our board to even be able to say as a group what we would like. So um, I'd like Victoria and Shannon to start off this evening um, and just do it and then we'll make the discussion through and then we'll talk about the room use study request that came up. Great, thanks. Well, thanks for having us and it's good to see you all again. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned last month, I presented at the SAU meeting. Um, with each election cycle, new players, new priorities, new agendas rise to the surface. So it's a good practice before the advisory committee comes together again to organize our work for the upcoming year. 
um, to just make certain that we are doing so with the full support and guidance of the board. So that was really my intention at the meeting last month. Um, the structure that was recommended last month, just as a reminder, and I think you all have the slides that were presented, um, was a joint facilities advisory committee. So a large committee that would work across the district with subcommittees specific to each district. And in the presentation last month, we suggested they be called uh, building and grounds committees. So the South Hegan building and grounds, Amherst building and grounds, really not that different than how we were kind of set up initially, um, other than we're just sort of refining this committee as we go along. Uh, the building and grounds committees for the district was a suggestion of Roger Preston, the director of facilities. So kind of how this would work, these subcommittees would meet, focus on their areas. So your representatives would be obviously on the South Hegan district, talk about the priorities, talk about what needs to happen, and then report back at the joint facilities advisory committee with the other subcommittees and look at, oh, well, wait, we have this happening in Amherst and Mount Vernon has this happening and South Hegan has this happening. And, you know, what about the timing and prioritization and all that? So then the JFAC would discuss if a recommendation needed to be made that would get voted on in that larger group, then we would come back to the, the individual board to make those recommendations. Um, obviously the final determination and what happens with those recommendations lies with the board. The board would then direct the advisory committee, okay, we like this, let's roll with it. Can you help us disseminate the information to the community or you know, kind of go from there. Um, yeah, so it's that, not much different than yeah. how we were working in the last several years. Um, I think changing the name to Building and Grounds and having specific district is uh, maybe what threw anyone off at that meeting, um, but it's not the intent of it. It's zero difference from previous years. So we're here to answer any questions, but we also um, don't really have any information beyond that. Um, we weren't really sure what yeah. information was needed. Um, so yeah, so I don't know what people's thoughts are. Do you want, you know, that when the building and grounds is more a Roger thing. So the, the, you know, do people want to, my thought is, do we need to include Mount Vernon? If this is all districts that was right. Yeah. That was um, that I think that because now that I know they have some projects up there, right. That are coming up. I believe they did discuss and our budget affects Mont Vernon's taxes as much as Mont Vernon's. <laughs> so I want to make sure they're included. Um, so what are thoughts? My Any opinions, thoughts? My I had one thought, but I want to hear others first. Like, do you have any opinions on what they've said or direction forward? Dan? I think it's important that we put together a you know, school by school committee of some kind that includes the principals and and grounds and Roger and to, to just say what space do we have at each school? How is it being utilized? I know you guys probably already did that, but um, I'm new here, so um, and can we contribute something now towards some of our space issues without going through a bond? process because even if we get the bond it's going to be a couple of years before we can even do anything but is there something we can do now to utilize available space that maybe exists here at the high school or um, yeah hence the room use study discussion right. that, that is on the on the agenda so that's my thought on is uh, do we want to ask um, Mike Galen to look at what does the what's the percentage use of our building look like throughout the day? Um, is it worth the time to say, hey, you know, because we get a lot of questions. Do we have room in the annex? There are many people who still, even after the delivery session, still think there's room in our annex. And I don't know if it's worth us going through that study. I Just to say, hey, there might be space that we can utilize in another way that we can offer towards maybe Amherst School District, um, Yes. So the, the master schedule document we provided the last couple of years to the advisory finance committee and the public uh, actually has all the data you need to, to do that work actually because it includes every room number in the building, I think. So 
I think it's already. You might have the wrong numbers on. Okay. I think. And it informed the work of, of the committee early on. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's that's part of why that was ruled out. But I, I but I think it's a good point. It's clearly something that keeps popping up in the community and and needs to you know be discussed again. Be looked. Um, but in just terms of the, the committee and how we function, because I think yes, that's, that's what I want to get back to. Yes, yeah. I want to get back to. Um, it's, I think that would be the you know a great a great space and mm -hmm. place to really dive into that mm -hmm. with so that would be the the beauty of having you know a district by district building and grounds committee that comes together each month because then they could talk collaboratively each of those subcommittees would include and it was in the presentation last month board members administrators employees from the SAU mm -hmm. and citizens right so mm -hmm. that good mix of both and we would probably want to ask for faculty and potentially students on our end because that's how yeah. Keegan works as a community. And, and that's how the community probably. works starting out. I mean, when we started JFAC in what, 2018, we sat at the brick school around the table. We had community council members. We had teachers. Um, and, you know, as time went on, it dwindled, which is another reason for coming back to the board. I think we really need to get organized and formalized all of it and make sure that the boards and the, the community members are collaborating together because I do think at some point along the way communication <coughs> kind of broke down um, in various pockets um, so you know here we, here we are now to kind of shore it up yeah but yes absolutely yeah um, so the the one piece of concern I had and I've I've talked with Victoria at different times about it and I've had brief conversations with with Shannon about it um, that the more I worked with JFAC, what I felt was that there was a very big marketing arm that JFAC became and that it was really working at almost like Amherst, you know, let's build the Amherst school. And so Segan was kind of doing their own thing. So I like the idea of this building and grounds committee that can go work on their different parts. But if the JFAC meeting could be really just sharing of the ideas, um, because I know I spent, you know, many times at the JFAC meetings where it was, let's go through building the school and sitting with the architects and everything else. And I was kind of like, I want this to be more across the districts and yeah. let and let that let the group that does the Amherst school building work off on a different side note. So I just I, that's my Can clarification. I jump in there to kind of, yeah, I know you and I have had a conversation mm -hmm. just to make sure that everybody else yeah. has this so we get that conversation. Um, the way that the JFAC had initially worked was just as a JFAC, just an advisory committee. At some point, we broke into some subcommittees. We had a PR subcommittee. We're going back two years now. Like, we're not just talking in the last six months. So we had a PR subcommittee. Um, so Hegan has already done an architect and engineering study several years ago for, I think, about probably 150000 I think it was more, actually. It could have been more. Okay. Yeah, so that was already included several years ago. So at some point there was a Sohegan 2, it was called Sohegan 2.0. So at some point there was a Sohegan 2.0. There was also uh, a Clark School subcommittee so that we could discuss with residents about the possible future for Clark. Um, what happens is that when we create an agenda, there are certain, some things that were never brought back to the JFAC agenda. And so a lot of the work was done and was discussed from the Amherst perspective, but it was done not from um, a JFAC trying to squeeze out Sohegan, but no, when the two not. ideas were presented, Sohegan not, you know, some of you were there, some of you weren't there, right? But Sohegan had kind of taken their things and said, we're gonna run with our thing. Whereas Amherst School Board had said, we're gonna run with it and can you help us work on these other pieces and stay involved? Um, so where those, you know, where the, uh, focus may have seemed like it was on Amherst. It, it was because it was on Amherst. Um, and it was also because some things were not brought to agendas with JFAC. For example, when um, the voters guide came out regarding the science labs, the science labs were something that were included in Sohegan 2.0. However, those science labs and the plan for them this year was never brought in front of JFAC. So it was not brought in front of JFAC. And well, we did discuss it though with JFAC. The final plan yes. was not brought in front of JFAC or discussed about what the the annual plan would be for it so because of some things like that you have seen the name jfac appear through some amherst uh correspondence but not through some so you can correspondence in the past so yeah so any input 
or do you like what where they've said about the different buildings and grounds or and it feels like you're I mean I, I don't know exactly what to say but I, I mean I do like the idea of us having we need to share yeah we, we need to share, share and then and then having individual subcommittees and then the sharing of information I know this gets a little substantive as opposed to structural but um, I think one of the things when we're looking at the size here and we're looking at available rooms and what's what's out there or not it's not just what's being used but I mean, it's got to be being used differently than it was when some of you were built because there used to be less kids or the same amount of kids in just this building. Mm -hmm. And now we need, and I'm not I'm putting that air quotes only because I don't know if we need it or not. We may need it. I'm not saying we don't, but we, we have this other building we're also using for the same number of kids that I think this building was structurally designed for. And there may be really, really good reasons for that. I don't know, maybe it's changed its education structure, it changes the size, but I think that piece needs to be explained if we're, you know, I mean, and, and this is across the different districts, but when the question comes up, is there room at, at the annex, is there additional room here? If, the, if our answer is no, we need to understand and be able to articulate why, why it's no, when this main building used to be able to house as many kids as we have in both buildings now. Yeah, and I think, you know, when yeah. in, in the early days, and not to kind of go back to like how we started and kind of where we evolved, evolved or however you want to frame it, um, we were regularly invited to individual board meetings to make presentations. And then kind of somewhere along the way that sort of dwindled because, you know, other things come up and we had COVID happening and, and whatever. So I think as part of this sort of renewal and and you know commitment if, if this is the way the boards choose to go i think a regular time <coughs> where it's you know not only the board member who's embedded on the building and grounds but someone else who does that kind of comes in you know because mm -hmm. you can't hold it all right like yep. it's helpful to have not only the board you know just a regular standing it doesn't need to be every month right it could be every other month or Mm -hmm. whatever but having that as part of the commitment in the structure and any other suggestion that I would like to make um, <laughs> regarding committees and committee structure um, and it was funny because when the mentoring folks were talking about onboarding I was like well you know that kind of goes for for this too right which is why I felt the need to come um, but I, I would love to as we regroup and reorganize kind of the town does a really nice job with their advisory committees of setting time frames so like if I'm on the reclamation for example and that's a two-year term or a two-year term or whatever um, that we look at doing something like that for for this particular committee because I think this is a long-standing thing that's going to outlive most of our involvement in this room right um, so that's something else you know that I think as we're doing this right now like this is a real opportunity um, to, to put all those structures in place and that's what I would like to do once we're kind of given that green light of support and we can kind of sit down we've had some folks reach out from the community um and so i do think it's time you know to get some some new energy in um kind of look at how many folks you know do we need on each building and grounds committee and, and what those terms look like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm no now no that's great that. no that's good <laughs> that's good i think it, it, it helps it helps to talk about the structure of what right. you are envisioning and i think that's important right yeah yeah john yeah, I, I mean, JFAC was started to solve a big problem, which is space issues at the lower grades, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it, well, it was actually a I mean, number of things that sort of coalesced at the same time. So we were started because um, there was a, a number of issues in our lower grades, not only space, um, but also deteriorating systems um, and the useful life systems. And here at our high school, TAT um, voters had just supported a um, architectural engineering study that was heavily led by um, then Principal Sully and the Community Council. Um, so that was happening, and it was evident that there were going to be a number of recommendations and suggestions for this school, while we also had all of these bubbling to the surface issues at our lower grades, and well, what are we going to do? We're gonna have this, you know, everything kind of exploding all at once like the top of the other things that we were talking about earlier. So that was sort of the the idea of, of JFAC and why it started was um, 
to just try to pull everyone together. Yeah, and those problems still exist, so exactly. JFAC should still exist. Right. Yeah. Um, and what Anna was alluding to, and 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 Stephanie, and I, I'm hearing it as well. You know, this space utilization is a good place to start um, because you're right. This facility was built to house more students than are currently enrolled. This room didn't used to exist. It used to be classrooms, for example. Okay, so this is so maybe this maybe there's things to do. There's a cafeteria in the annex. It's not a cafeteria anymore, but facilities are there. You just have to to hook them back up again, for example. Um, I, so the question in the community is, well, geez, I was think creatively, right? Can you turn that into uh, uh, Sohegan Junior High School? Well, that would mean seventh and eighth grade might fold up into, into uh, the Sohegan Cooperative. Um, that might solve a lot of problems with onboarding of students and getting them ready for high school. That consolidates the districts we talked about that a couple of years ago. It, 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 there's a lot of um, interest in concepts when you start talking about that. But that isn't going to involve Amherst and, and uh, Sohegan to cooperate on that. And the Joint Facilities Advisory Committee could be a good way to do that. Yet, if that were to happen, if that space is available, what, you know, you could be a creative thought in, that I'm hearing is um, that pulls two grades out of AMS. You could pull one grade up from from Wilkins School and alleviate a lot of space problems. Just that move alone. Is that feasible? I don't know. To your point, it's a question. Um, it's an interesting one because that could solve a lot of problems for a lot less money than, than was rejected ostensibly. Um, so there's a lot of interest um, out there. When I talk to people about it, it's not the, it's, it's a, it's a fairly common refrain that I've been hearing the people I'm talking to. So I'd be interested in exploring that and having that be part of the JFAC objective. And um, I think a lot of that work would start here at Sohegan to do this two buildings analysis and see where we do, where, where, where do we stand with that? And what would it take to, to implement that and whether that's cost effective or not? Um, so that could be included among the mission objectives, then you know, I say that's, that's worthwhile for sure. So from our perspective, just so you know, um, doing the space study at Sohegan is nothing that Shannon and I are personally against um, or for or anything like that. Um, we had done our space study of Sohegan previously by talking to administration and um, understanding from the, the then Sohegan board that no, they don't not use the annex how people say. Um, so the, the space study, the space has been talked about. Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't have more information, um, but all different pieces like that need to have somewhere that they go. And so if the Sohegan board is sitting here and talking about doing a space study and Amherst school board's not sitting here listening to the Sohegan meeting, there's no connection. JFAC provides a joint facilities advisory committee. That's why there's a connection. So to say, okay, subcommittee that is Sohegan, Sohegan is going to figure out whatever space situation there is and bring it to the Joint Facilities Advisory Committee. And then the Joint Facilities Advisory Committee can you know, listen to the ideas, see what the answer is. Um, I know that for, I would be very surprised for things to have changed so significantly um, to hear that the proper long-term solution is to put more grades into the annex. I, don't think that what we've talked about in the past or what we've heard in the past would lead us to believe that putting two grades in this school for a long term without some serious renovation funding is um, it's going to happen. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do the, in, do the research and do the information. And it sounds like from Superintendent Steele that we already have a lot of that information for you, know, you guys to kind of look through. Well, I think we have the data, but to Anna's point, there's also a concern about um, how that is used too. I thought that was a good point I, I didn't think of. So we have the raw data, but I think there's also a need for like, as John brought up, this room used to be two classrooms when the school was built. Now it's a totally, totally different function. I think there's been some other spaces like that as well um, along the way. So it's beyond just the numbers to Anna's, Anna's yep. point. Yeah. Which is similar to the younger grades as well. well the schools that were built over 50 years ago, they are used 
very differently than they were 50 years prior. Right. If I could just continue a little bit. Um, I mean, I think it's really important to continue the work. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, um, and no matter what the solution is, it's going to be a significant investment, probably on the level of a bond somewhere. Question is, I think why there may be is more impetus is now. Now people were staring down an 80 plus million dollar bond and they're like choking on their choking on it, right? And so it's like, okay, well, gee, could we build out something else and, and solve solve the fundamental issue, you know, to provide an excellent education at the lower grade levels in a, in a, in a, in the, the right modern environment to where uh, the class sizes are are, are right sized and the, the, the facilities are um, sufficient for that. I don't know that you need a, a brand new Cadillac, unless this is no shine on anybody, but you need, the, you need the right space and the right staff to deliver the appropriate education. That's the primary mission. So how can we do that the most effective way possible? And maybe we need to take a look at step one and just sort of revisit that notion. So I don't know if I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, Victoria, that it's, it's um, no, I do agree with you. I agree with you that it wouldn't be done without a significant investment. I think that's what basically what you said. And the only question is, where do you make the investment within the whole SAU system to effective to get the effective goals that you can get the public to support behind? Sure. So. Yeah, so I think everything, um, John, that you're saying is exactly what we're talking about, the conversations mm -hmm. that have, have been happening and occurring for four years and that need to obviously continue, right? Like, you come forward, the community's like, well, no. So then it's, okay, did we have the right plan? Did we have the best plan? What didn't we consider? Hence, like, let's get some new life onto the committee. So I don't think we're talking about different things here yeah, in terms I don't of either. solving the problem. We started with a problem to solve, and we still have a problem to solve. And I'm just here asking if we can solve the problem and work together. That's kind of where I'm where I'm at uh, an hour after we were supposed to talk. So um, sorry to be okay. direct, but. Well, then okay. enough for me. I, I think that the work needs to continue. I appreciate you willing to stay on, to be honest with you. It's, it's really, really helpful. It's important. Yes. Tim. Quick question for you guys. So first of all, love the work, and I hope that it continues, and I, I know it will. Um, and I was one of those members of town trust last after the biggest light bulb. But, so. but anyway, um, obviously the bond was defeated, handled. So are you guys looking at trying to recruit any of those people that you believe you know, were the no votes to be on the committee to say, hey, you know, you get buy-in from, from all sides, right? Because those are the people that are going to help you uh, understand what the um, hurdles you're trying to overcome to be able to get out a, a, a project that's sellable, if you will, to the public, right? Um, to get those folks. I, I don't know if any efforts have been made yet. Um, let me know if there's any other questions. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, that, you know, we've been in a bit of a holding pattern. I mean, there are people who have directly come to us and said, hey, you know, we'd like to participate in this committee, what we can do. Um, no aggressive efforts at the moment because I wanted to make sure, again, that I, you know, you, you don't want to waste anyone's time if the boards are like, no, we're all going to kind of do our own thing and we are, we're done with this, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I agree with you and it, it was always sort of the mantra of, of our committee that any, anybody was, was welcome to join. Of course. And, right, yeah. And several people, um, Brian Coogan and Tom Gauthier, who are both still involved in some capacity, both went to the initial JPEC meeting, which was not even really a JPEC meeting, but went to the meeting and did not support a new school. So it's not um, it's not everybody who joins or who supports an effort needs to believe in a brand new school and brand new HVAC everywhere and you know top to bottom. Um, it really is um, a blending of ideas and of people. Um, but yes, obviously. Thank you. I think, I mean, if I have to summarize what I'm hearing is that, you know, we definitely, we're all for working together with all the districts. I, I don't think there's a disagreement on that from anyone, <laughs> um, you know, with a buildings and grounds sort of concept. And I know we have a couple, was it Dan and John and Pim, I think are all on JPAC for this coming year. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I think 
you know, going forward, it makes sense to all work together and group reorganize, work through however you want to organize, right? Um, the building and use study, or the, sorry, the, the room use study question. So how old was that? When was that study done? A room use study? Yeah, for here at the high school. When was that done? I'm not sure that we've done. We did like four years ago when we initially looked at like, and I, I can't even remember like why we said no to that idea. It's been that long. So that's what I'm wondering. Is yeah. that data not, I mean, would it be close enough to being valid data that you could sit down and work through, like since Dan, John, Pim are on JFAC, work through whatever data is already yeah. there, or is it worth doing a whole new? Yeah, my my suggestion, I, and I understand. Listen, I know my uh, opinion carries about as much weight as a feather on the moon right now. But I'm still going to offer my suggestion here, which is, um, I really think uh, John, Dan, and some other folks uh, should really dive into this concept of seventh and eighth grade at the annex. I think it really deserves being explored. Um, we did that, but as I said, it's been so long ago that I honestly don't remember the things that we got to a point of saying those are deal breakers. We also looked at the at the Birch Park. Uh, property at one point in time um, as an option for a school and we got to a point where we had to say no to that and I don't, I don't remember those reasons either it's been that long ago in the process but we looked at all sorts of things like that and um, I think the, a good next step would be a group of people willing to spend the better part of a morning um, and uh, to really dive into that unfortunately it was Lance Whitehead from La Valley Brenzinger who was behind a lot of that work who's no longer our architect of record um, much to his chagrin. Um, so uh, he's not probably readily available to donate time to help us investigate that, but his data in his reports we still have. So, um, but to your question, it's also possible in four years that some things have changed that require a fresh look at it. But it's not, the issue is not going to go away until the people who have the question, to Pim's point, um, are in the room and have the chance to dive into it. So, um, here's my thoughts is when we have the SAU meeting and, you know, I think when we come together and discuss it, like, yes, absolutely, you know, Suhegan's apps is, is in, invested. Um, I would like to see Mount Vernon included as well, which they weren't in the previous one, just because I know they have costs coming forward. Yeah, I agree. And that was really clear to us, I think, you know, toward the very end. And that was part of the recommendation. Yep. That I <clears throat> yep. And then, and then the I'm going to let Dan, John and Pim go forward and work through as they see fit and work with the school board and JFAC about room use. Regarding, Mon if I could, regarding Mon Vernon. So they have appointed a rep uh, to the JFAC committee this year that will serve a, serve that role. Uh, but Mon Vernon, in terms of the Mon Vernon School District, and perhaps Mr. O'Keefe can back me up here, um, they developed about five, six years ago their facilities plan, and they've been doing it every year, putting money aside for it, and front-loading and saving money for all of their projects. So they're pretty much good for the next 15, 20 years with their, with their building itself, assuming that uh, don't, things don't change with uh, the 7th and 8th grade tuition agreement, and assuming that uh, we don't... Uh, boil over our capacity of the existing building, making those assumptions um, they're in really good shape that way. So they're not going to be coming at it from a capital um, expenditure point of view for their building, but they will be coming at it from how it affects their local tax rate. Yeah, because we, how Sohegan falls into that Mount Vernon tax rate and want to make sure that we are not, that we're, that we are coordinating and not ignoring. As a former Mount Vernon board member, did I get it right? Yeah, so I mean, Mount Vernon's issue right now is our capital projects on the municipality. So they're, large. they're sizing a five plus million for a town with, you know, very limit, limited to non-existent tax rates. Mm -hmm. So the middle school project was extremely worrisome to a good deal of the subset of people that live up there because the tuition agreement requires bond payments from our community to the tune of what our committee found out right around six million dollars. So for that, that would pay for all of our capital projects and our fire truck uh, all in one swoop and we wouldn't even own the building. And so that is a sizable, sizable issue. So Ma Vernon's involvement in JFAC right now could be extremely valuable to at least help that dialogue and share that, that perspective because that has to be this board's purview as well because the decisions that we make here do impact that community just as much as the Amherst Middle School project. Just for anyone who has not watched the last ASB meeting, um, the Amherst School Board did give Amy Facey the direction to 
focus on the elementary school rather than on the elementary school and the middle school for our CD application. Mm -hmm. All right, good. <coughs> good. Heavy, thank you so much for coming. Thank you Appreciate all the, the time. discussion. I think it was good for us to get it, it all great. out there. It was good. Thank, thank you, you for your patience. And your patience, I'm yes. Struggling to, uh, there we go. Oh, thank you. Okay. So now we're going to get on with our agenda items of reports received. So why don't we just go down the list? And the first one's principal's report. Mike, is there anything you want to highlight overall, or do you want us to just dive in if anyone has questions? Uh, let me highlight a, a couple things. Uh, th this report's a little bit smaller because uh, at the time we, we did two for April. Uh, and so there, at the time we, we posted this was right before break. And so uh, we, we kind of we kept it pretty brief. And, and so we just kind of updated uh, a few of the, the events that are occurring and some enrollment stuff, the hiring process, uh, just so people were, you know, you know, got a taste of what was happening. But, you know, uh, prior to that, you know, we had uh, had Fang Fest, went really smooth. Uh, kids had a good time, uh, you know. Uh, NJ Hutchison, who kind of, you know, as a sophomore, was a student's activities person, did his, you know, did his best to kind of kind of run that in, in partnership with, with community council. And, and the kids are really into it. And they had a great time and it was fun and lots of events and a lot of people here, um, you know, kind of enjoying being part of the Sohegan community and, and students and staff. Uh, so that, that was a pretty good highlight. You know, moving forward into May, all sorts of events around like end of the year awards, different, you know, di different trips. Uh, the seniors have their week, um, so that was that's some things that are ongoing. Um, as you can see, that you know we're actively trying to get the campus ready in, in, as we work with Roger and, and the grounds group and, and, and the custodians for you know holding a lot of events and having a lot of guests there. Uh, so we appreciate appreciate that. Um, just some highlights from from my world. Uh, we in, in, in here we had a teacher and staff appreciation week. And I uh, really appreciate the, the different groups that were involved from PTSA to administrative assistance, working with admin to kind of organize some of the events to celebrate the success, the, the staff and all their efforts. Uh, the school board was, was, was heavily involved with, with the breakfast and I appreciate that. And, and uh, we have some thank you cards if you wanna grab yours and toss them out. Aww. So we appreciate that. Um, and uh, so one of the things that you know, uh, we we kind of been working on with more to come. This is just a a brief uh, thing. You're going to hear some work around summer work planning about how we're going to use our time during the summer and some of the initiatives that we're going to focus on. Uh, that will be kind of getting us into the next meetings, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about grading reporting. Uh, I can give a little more of an update uh, about the process and where we're at in a moment. Um, we uh, conducted some surveys around school efficacy. And school culture and climate with the with the staff and and uh had roughly 59 responses you know so that's a little bit of an improvement you know and uh so we have that data and uh, it was a third party uh survey from um george washington uh university and uh and so uh we'll be talking a little bit about that we got we preliminary like took an analysis of it um you know, as a principal, I've uh, spent the last probably six, seven weeks, Maddie probably knows a little bit, like meeting with, with students. I probably have had uh, roughly about 100, 110 kids in for about 10, 15 minutes as I just kind of chat with kids and try to put names to faces, continue as, you know, we're in second year getting a, a lay of the land. Um, hiring process, you know, we have some retirements and, 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 some, and, and some people moving on to do different things. We're in, we're in the thick of that. Uh, and uh, we're pretty pleased with the process and, and, and the results that it's that it's bringing. So, um, lots happening. It's a busy place. It's vibrant. It's active, and uh, you know, excited about the work that we're doing. So, a lot of good things happening. But I can answer any questions about certain topics as well. Before I take any questions, I just want to say if anyone had a chance or can find on Facebook the staff, um, the faculty dance for Fang Fest. The energy was quite impressive. <laughs> they have moves that I cannot do. <laughs> so it was great to see. 
Uh, so questions for Mike? Anything on the Anna? At some point, are we going to be able to see the results of the survey? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else? Yeah, I'll, I'll add something. Um, thanks for doing the third party survey. I just personally really believe that that's the best way to yep. try to get honest responses from people, even if it's not, you know, full participation. Um, one would hope that you would eventually get to everyone like would feel comfortable with that. So I appreciate that very much. And, and, and you know, staff had the option. You know, everyone was involved, you know, so if you were uh, a teacher, you know, there was a uh, kind of an additional survey, but all staff were able to take part in, in the school culture and climate. And then, but we really wanted to hone in like on efficacy and the ability to to do really good work in, in, in your role as a teacher here and influence the, the, the learning of our students and their experiences. And we gave teachers and, and staff the option that they could remain anonymous or they could, you know, add their name to it. And I'd say probably a third added their names to the surveys. And, and for me, the, the sign of a healthy organization is when more people add their names to the survey. And you know, I'm confident we'll get there. I'm not a big proponent of anonymous surveys. It, it doesn't really do people, you know, a good service. But at, 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 at right now, I understand why, and, and we'll continue on with that. And and uh, we'll give, always give that option. And and uh, so we'll take a look at it. Uh, just we did it last week, and and just kind of put it together, uh, Galen and I, you know, earlier this week or or yesterday. And uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll 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 continue to work with that with the teachers and. And we plan on uh, some surveys and information gathering from students, uh, particularly seniors, and some families about kind of like reflecting on the year as, as the year goes on, as, uh, as we get closer to June 10th. Yeah, nice. And did um, George Washington University help you develop the questions? No, it's pretty standard survey, oh. you know, that they use for the art of school science improvement. Uh, and uh, so, and there's a way you score it and, and analyze it. And so it's research based. and. Uh, and so what we wanted to do is not create our own. We wanted to create, you know, from a, an accredited uh, post-secondary university that was research-based, that was tried and true. And uh, when we present it, we'll, we'll kind of walk through, you know, why we selected those surveys. Um, that part was subjective. You know, I was heavily involved with that with you know, Dana Curran, you know, based on our needs and what we in our schools and, and district initiatives. Um, and, um, and so, for me is really important is regardless of who's in what role it, it, it is what's the, what work is happening you know what i mean like it, it, and and so you can be well intended but if it's not you know yielding the results and the environment is not what you want it doesn't matter how well they like you right or how good of a communicator they think you are at the end of the day what is happening in your building is what is most important and to me that's what we wanted to glean from this survey and I, I think we're well on our way and, I, and we're going to continue on with that trend. And uh, uh, the staff, I, I think it was well received. You know, I think the, the it was it was thoughtful and genuine. So I'm excited about it and we'll, we'll get that to you in a formal kind of memo. You know, I'll go through Steve on how we want to present that. Steve, moving forward. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Um, and just one other observation um, on the um, interview hiring process, just looking at the you have a lot of breadth in the people who are on the, I guess, the committee. Yeah. Um, but when I read the last sentence about interviews for math positions, I just, I was like, oh, wait a minute. We got social studies and an English teacher, but no math or science teacher on the main committee. Now, you do say, though, that the group, you're joined by department specific numbers. So I, I guess I was just assuming that for yeah. hiring of math positions, you would bring in folks from the math. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I'll quickly kind of so yeah. There's a, a there's a core team that is on on for every interview, right? There's a core group, and then you see that group right there. Those teachers, that's the core team. Every position, keep it consistent. The norms are there, the values are there. So we're we're really being consistent on who we're bringing in. And so for various positions, you know, math was the the example that we use for various positions. We bring in, uh, you know, teachers from that department. You know, so it could be two or three additional math teachers for that. If we have a social studies, the two or three additional teachers from that department uh, for that piece. Where students come in, students give tours and provide feedback via, via survey, and then our, our teachers and uh, candidates are, are teaching a demo lesson where the students then provide feedback on their experience in, in the lesson. And uh, that all gets formulated 
And uh, I am not part of that process in, in, until the the end when they come with me and, and, and then I look at the candidates that they bring and, and these are advisory. So they'll bring two or three to the principal and I'll take a look at it based on all these factors and I'll make a, a name or two to Stephen Adam and, and, and then we'll kind of go from there. Uh, I am very pleased with the process. I think it's thorough. I think at a time right now where people are being pretty casual in their hiring processes throughout the state, that, that I know they're my colleagues around the state as high school principals, they're being pretty casual because of the state of, a, of affairs. And we are determined to find the highest quality educators that are their best match for our students. And so we're gonna continue on with a process that some candidates think that's not really necessary. Well, if it's not really necessary, we don't, we're not interested. Right, you know, and so we we think that that's where we're at. So uh, I'm pleased, and uh, I think you guys will be pleased with the people that we bring forward. That's great to hear. Thanks for explaining that, Mike. Appreciate it. Other questions? Um, so I just have I have one. Um, the so I was looking at like, the New Hampshire SAS, the timing of the testing. And I was thinking about to these past two weeks. And on top of, so we come back from spring break. There's kids are doing JLP. We just had prom. We had jazz night. Kids are taking AP tests, senior project panels. They were all like within a four day time span. And I'm hoping that going forward, we can look at maybe, I don't know if like New Hampshire SAS, I don't know if we even have a choice on the no, date. You, so that's not a choice. But I know like prom, jazz, those things, some of those things I would love to make sure that they're not on top of AP testing, <clears throat> if possible. Well, because if more kids took the AP test, it'd probably be more of a priority. Well, I think also. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to flat out tell you, you but right? Like also, kids aren't taking because they're looking at this like. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there, there's a bigger conversation there on is. AP yeah. testing, yeah. And, and I'm just being very candid with you. Yeah. And it's, you know, some things are non-negotiable for us that you have to do SAS. You, you have to offer AP test when College Board says you offer the AP test. Oh. Uh, so Hegan has chose, you know, chose over the years to have Division One JLP Senior Project as others graduation requirements, and I do think there's a need to reflect on on the whole thing. And I've said that from the moment I entered here in March of 22 or 2020, is you know we're we're putting a lot of demands on both students and staff the way we're designed and function. And I do think there's some reflection and, and I don't have all the answers to it. I have thoughts on it, but I do think some reflection on what we ask people to do. But this window of May, I, you know, anyone who's been in education for a long time, like we, no one likes it. Yeah. <laughs> no yeah. one likes, you know, coming back and dealing with May because it's it's just a lot of demands, right? And and so I do think there's some things that we can control, but there needs to be some reflection and conversation. That would be great. You know, from students and 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 uh, and, uh, and staff and, and parents. And so I think we can get there. I don't disagree with you, Stephanie. Like, I agree with you. Like, I feel it, I, right? I'm, I'm right on board it. with you. Yeah, you know, so I think we can we can do that. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, I have it in, in my notes. <laughs> so we can come back and revisit that. Yeah when you guys would like yeah okay can we add that to our board retreat that topic absolutely i've been saying since 1999 that after april vacation we should just begin summer <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's a it's a it's a volatile it's month mm -hmm. it's personal time. So. yep we were going to talk about that i think next meeting about the timing of that <laughs> we moved that one because of so many discussions going on yes so that's coming up on the 19th um so if there's no more questions on principals report uh facilities update if everyone saw that report with everything roger has <clears throat> gone through and done and his team um which is great. They're in their treasurer's report. Could I, could I just say something yeah. about the facilities and yeah, just sure. to kind of dovetail on what Adam said and Stephen, you kind of confirmed a little bit. Um, but one, it'd be nice to be at the place where Mont Vernon is, where we don't actually need a J JFAC. So we're Roger, we've got we've got the, the money. We're saving it appropriately for the capital maintenance. We we have the fifteen year vision. It's all kind of dialed in, and Roger can just do what he's this great work he's doing and get extra life out of our stuff and we can get reports and and uh, we where the future is that road is just so 
you know, I'd really like to get to that point in, in my lifetime. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to say that for the record, facilities wise. It'd be nice, it would be a huge success if we didn't, if we could dissolve JPEG at some point. And then we'd have what Mount Vernon is enjoying right now. So, for the record. Yes. Uh, any other comments or questions about facilities or the treasurer's report? Nothing? Okay. That's reports received. Consent agenda. Um, I'm going to go through each of these because there's a couple things that on the um, policies that we need to pull or discuss. Uh, draft minutes. Are there any changes that need to be made or anything on minutes? Tim? Other than adding my name. <laughs> but his name was not. <laughs> so that will be added. <laughs> um, budget transfers. Any questions on the budget transfers? Any, any comments, Amy, on those? Or, I think self explanatory. <laughs> No, these are different from the prior. So that brings up a valid point based on your email of us having to redo that. Are we going to do that next week? From our last meeting, we didn't do that oh, properly. Yeah. No, we're not going to do that. So, so, okay. These are not those budget okay. okay. yeah. transfers. These transfers are there's a staff member who works point five special ed point five regular ed is budgeted yep. incorrectly all in special ed so. Mm -hmm. That's getting corrected, and then the second transfer, um, there's a change in, in student needs from out of district tuition to other support services, which are other professional services for mental or physical issues, um, or potentially health care services. So these are not to do with the default transfers, we'll do those later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, then the can ask, can, sorry yes. sorry can I ask a follow-up question on the on the special education transfers for un, unexpected things is that is that something do do you, do you weigh the decision like okay should should we draw from the you know emergency funds for this very purpose or or take is it a choice um, that you go the process we just so so it's a just a different need from what was originally anticipated yeah so now it's just still a special education right. account, but it's a different one. So it's based on the, what the needs are of, for that student. Right. So it isn't, it's not correct to be in the account that it's going to be. So, oh, I see. so the need was already there. We're just putting the money in the right bucket. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. Never mind then. Get it. It's not an addition. Nope. Addition. Not addition. Okay. Thank you. Gotcha. Thanks. All right, um, the policy. So policy GBCE, this training and information relative to child sex abuse prevention. This this did not go through policy. I don't training. remember, have a memory of any, I, yeah, I was any of these three policies, except for the board superintendent relationship has been talked about, it did go through policy, it was talked about the SAU. Um, this GBCE, and I don't remember it and the IJOC uh, and the field trip one I don't remember and I think the IJOC was accidentally left from last meeting where we approved the field trip and this was attached to that field trip I think this was just accidentally left in there so we're going to oh. pull GBCE and IJOC since those never went through policy committee okay so the only one on there is BDD and this is a second reading for BDD so um, are there any last minute conversations or questions on that one or can we move forward? Well, and, and just as a summary, so this, as far as I recall, this policy has been in place for a long time. And um, there's been some debate about the table at the end and whether it's worth while keeping it. And um, the table at the end is something that we added, somebody in our position added many years ago. It's not in the New Hampshire School Board Association's template policies, which is usually our starting place for policy adoption. 
and somewhere along the way that got added. So there are differing views um, about whether or not it's it's helpful to have that or potentially hurtful to have that table at the end. Otherwise, I believe the 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 policy text is substantially similar to the New Hampshire uh, School Board Association's template. Dan? How, how was there discussion of how it was hurtful? Well, it, it's is a question of is it, is it mandatory or aspirational? I mean, it says what the roles and responsibilities are. So um, let's say number five for both the board and the superintendent is to deal always in an ethical, honest, straightforward, open and above board manner with the superintendent or the board, depending on the relationship, the staff, students and community. Sure, everyone, no one would disagree with that as a as an aspirational notion. But if it's written there, then it, it, it allows a person, somebody, anybody to say, aha, you're not being ethical or you're not being straightforward and now you're violating your policy and now you have what? Does that, is that, now you have a, a conflict that, that does somebody sue you over it? Um, this, this is why it could be um, potentially damaging. It's not required by law to have these things. It's, it's, you know, or a solution could be to make it very clear that these, these um, endeavor to achieve these ideals you know, kind of qualifying language might might help. It kind of reads as a mission statement. Kind of right. So that's just, a, yeah, that's background on for where this is and why it, it's here and um, some of the dissenting views on, on back and forth. Another on the on the fourth side, I mean, um, you know, this has been around for a long time. Why would we just rip it out for no reason? I mean, you know, it's like, OK, I don't know. My personal opinion is, and I've been arguing to just delete it. I don't think it's particularly helpful, or at least qualify it in some way with some qualifying language. So that would have to be sent back to policy committee. Or, well, it would be helpful if 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 that's what we think. I think it, in order to an effort to harmonize the policies, guys, I think that's very valuable. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to administer three different policies in exactly. three or or four. I mean, so to the extent it can be harmonized, it should give it a fair chance to do that. Okay. And honestly, we have a lot of new members on policy now, so for, for, to allow them the opportunity to maybe reflect on it once more, um, then they can weigh in. So yeah. we this can make won't come decision. up for review again for what five years? Mm -hmm. Unless it changes or any member can bring this back up at any time. Uh, yeah. I mean, we can always normal board, right. Happens, yes. Right. Or is it five or seven? Yeah. Three or four different triggers that could happen. Yes. Yep. Changes in the law. Or it, we see it in an NHSBA update for whatever reason. Right. You know what triggered it to come up now? Because uh, yeah, it was, the, it was our normal. So last year we did the B policies, which are the board policies. So this was just among all of the B policies. It's been one that had been discussed multiple times. So it's just kind of trailing. And we have just kind of pushed it off a few times on agenda. So we really either need to pass this or say we're not passing it right. and we're pushing it back to policy and that's where we are. I guess I'm just wondering it was revised two years ago. Yeah. So I didn't know how it got out I think of the five it, years. I think it ah I that I don't remember exactly uh, why this came up two years ago. It could have been a New Hampshire School Board Association update, maybe I think so. Um and our old one probably had the table so we just married the two. Yep. You know? Um, and then it came up again in the B policy because that's where it is. So that's why it was reviewed again. So right now, I'm this year's G. So yeah. right now, I mean, I'm going to leave it in the consent uh, agenda unless anyone objects to, um, to leaving it in the consent agenda. So when we approve the consent agenda, it would be approved. BDD? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Unless, you well, want it, unless you want it pulled out and voted on separately. I don't know what, what members think about was the it, background. Was it approved this is, yeah, it was, it, so it's gone through, policy committee's gone through the SAU board and we've had a first reading. This is the second reading to just finally. Everyone else approved it? Every other district has Everybody approved it. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah, the policy committee had the debate and ultimately decided to keep the table in. Right. 
it went, then to, the it went to the SAU board. SAU board. Two we, readings on we it. We had the debate yeah. there. I had the debate yeah. there, yeah. yes. And to the individual boards. Okay. This so is the only this board is that has finally adopted. just, yeah. Right. So the other thing I'm thinking is that the, the table as near as I can tell is the same as the old table. Yes. Yeah. So there hasn't been a change on that. Um, and given that we could bring it up if we wanted to at some point. Anyone can bring it up. Um, We've got a lot of things coming up in the policy committee, and then John and I have 76 policies between us. That, or sorry, there's 76 that have my name on. Tell them what you're sharing with John. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little in favor of it. It's been through, and everyone else has approved it. You know, we can bring it up we in the future, but it's, I mean, it's. Hold on. Yeah. We'll leave it in consent unless there's an objection. I would like to vote against it just for the record. Okay, so we'll pull that out as a separate. Yes. Vote. Okay. Not a problem. But I'm not going to raise a big That's fuss right. about it, you know. Um, the general assurances. Would anyone like to speak to the general assurances? Does this let everyone know what they are? Like, I don't know if I have a brief description. Yeah. Every, every, every year that the federal government requires the state government to require us to sign off on how we're going to comply with the federal regulations requiring the all the various federal grants that we receive. And so this is a, a statement by penalty of perjury that um, I sign and that you guys uh, give me permission to sign first that says we're going to follow all the various regulations, rules, and procedures regarding federal funds. Our auditors, when they audit us, are required to then verify many of these things um, in great detail through what they call a single audit. And uh, so it's really just something we do every year. This is the third year in a row that it's been done in this particular manner, but you guys are authorizing me to sign on your behalf, saying that you're going to require me to follow all those regulations, rules, and procedures. And it's all of us saying that we're willing to risk our careers, livelihoods, and reputations to follow those procedures. In adherence with policy BDD. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that one, too. And we probably need to pull this one as well, because there's a recommended I motion. See that, I was going to say that, that has to be pulled as well, so we'll do that separately. OK. So, Stephanie, yes, one um, correction to Nay wants to make sure you know that the on the um, the board packet on the left, it says IJOC on the right. It says IJOA yeah. and IJOC. Anyway. We're yes, pulling we're it pulling. out anyway. Oh, you're not going to vote on it? No. OK. All right. So we're going to. Yes, we're pull, we're, not, we're pulling it because there's no reason for it to be in a consent agenda. Like it's an accidental attachment. Oh, okay. Fire so you're going to do one, two, three together, yep. right? I'm going to do one, two, and three together. Seven. Yep. Then okay. five separately and seven separately. So I make a motion to um, approve one, two, and three of the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Pim a second. Those in favor? Those opposed? None opposed. That passes. Um, can I have a motion to pa pass? Uh, Policy BDD as a second reading. I plan. I uh, make a motion to adopt policy adopt. BDD um, as written. Pim is a second. I uh, have already had a discussion on it. So uh, those in favor? Those opposed? Two opposed and no abstentions because that would be seven. Um, so that one will pass. And then can I have a motion for the general assurances authorization? So let me pull that back up here. Page 99. Motion to authorize the school board chairperson to sign the general assurances on behalf of the school board with understanding of the school board's obligations, including the enumeration. Including those enumerated in RSA 189A, 189A. And pursuant to the school board's own schedule. I'll second. All right. And those in favor, and opposed, and opposed, and that passes as well. What happened to four? What do we do with that? Pulled. Pulled, yes, OK. Because it That's never, but we don't, not sure why it was even in there. OK, good. So I'd like to put that in voted. Is it, is, it, is it correct that it's you, Stephanie, that signs it? Or Adam, are you signing it? Both. OK. It is correct, you're authorizing her to sign it. Mm -hmm. All right, so we don't need to authorize <coughs> you individually and pass this automatic. Whatever the motion lady has is what we have to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever motion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
we're voting on it again in a week and a half. You know. your credit for the work. There you go. Okay, uh, any updates on COVID-19 metrics? Yes, I'll be brief on this topic unless there are questions from the board. Uh, we're, there's five active cases at Sohegan right now in the community of Amherst. There's 35 cases that are active, 10 in Mount Vernon. Um, the test positivity rate, which d is debatable how valid it is, is 12.6%. Um, Amherst has hit the two-thirds mark of people vaccinated for what that's worth, 66.7%, exactly two-thirds. Um, <coughs> uh, Mount Vernon is just slightly behind at 62.8%. Um, we remain in blue and people are choosing to wear masks if they want to wear masks. Uh, we are forbidden from requiring masks if we wanted people to be required to wear masks. So there's not a lot we have available in our toolkit right now um, with COVID, but we are still monitoring things. We are still keeping track. One of the, uh, the stickiest issues right now is the one requirement that we ferreted out for people to wear masks is if someone's exposed to a family member they have to quarantine for 10 days at home. They can come back to school after five days if they agree to wear a mask for those next five days. That's a requirement, not a recommendation. That's the one area of requirement that we're enforcing. And we've ferreted that out with the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, uh, even today, because it came up for the first time where there's a question about it. So um, that's the one area where there's still a requirement that exists but it's a choice for those families because they can wait it out the 10 days if they want and not have to wear a mask. Uh, if they want to come back to school after five days, they have to for the next five days. So, but that's where we're at. But any questions? Yeah, one on that, on that dynamic, come back to school with a negative test in five days and wear the mask, or is there no testing component to that? I don't, if they're, they have to be fully vaccinated, first of all, to come back after five days, you have to be fully vaccinated and you have to have, be symptom free. Um, I'm not sure there's a requirement for a test. But that's not people who had it, John. That's people who live with someone who did. Correct. Right. Uh, so if you if you have COVID, Sharice okay. is the one that uh, parents are communicating with, and she has a standard policy that's mm -hmm. been vetted that she communicates to families if someone calls in and says their kid has. <clears throat> so these parameters completely changed. We, uh, yeah, we provide we provided the DHHS guidelines and weekly emails that we've sent out, so people have got them directly. Um, I'm not our reopening plan is is essentially moot at this point, um, but uh, we do have uh, whenever there's a call or a question, the same thing is provided to every every parent who calls with a question, and our, our nurses are very consistent in their application um, of these things. Any other questions? Well, no, I just wanted to say about the, the mask. I mean, the uh, it's kind of perfunct. I mean, it's I don't really do anything. Not not up. Not I mean the mask. What I mean is you don't have a way to enforce that. So no one's going to be monitoring that person for five days, right? Nobody's going to know really. So I, I mean, <clears throat> it, it, I appreciate the update though. I mean, it is a tool. We have limited tools. So um, uh, and I guess. You can also require proof of vaccination then if that's the requirement we do for those people yeah, we do but you can't do it for everybody nope only if there's an, a household exposure in the house and they want to come home before, or they want to come back to school five days or the 10 days half day. okay. Right. Yeah. okay great thanks okay. okay moving on to community council maddie I, is this going to be your last meeting or are you going to be here on the 19th too the 19th all right <laughs> So, in Community Council, we just elected our new moderator, Riley Devine, September 20th, mm -hmm. and we're going to have our executive um, elections, the Community Council elections, next Monday. So, that's when we'll figure out a school board rep. So, I'll get to introduce them at the next meeting. And then um, I have Rick here to talk also with us about this proposal. Um, so, we are going, or this past three councils, and now coming to you guys. So, we wanted a quicker start for community members so that they are more um, involved in council because currently there's a couple meetings at the beginning of the year before they are picked by the board that they aren't able to come to because they haven't been elected yet so we wanted to move the date that these are picked so i think do you want to talk about yeah can i give a real quick thing so everyone understands so what they're bringing up community council <laughs> felt 
strongly about this because the community members had brought it forward and um, speaking with the advisors, they pushed through an emergency sessions of changing their actual bylaws. So this, we don't have actually any policies with what they're talking about. We just follow community council bylaws. So they actually had an emergency vote on Monday and changed their bylaws for us. So we're gonna have a follow-up um, that we're going to have with an action <coughs> this, this evening. Right. Yeah, you press no. the button that's no towards right. me. On the other end. Side. Yeah. Just tap it, don't hold it. I know. It's like There you go. The Jets and Amherst. <coughs> so this requires approval. Is that correct? Actually, it's just a procedural change for us. But it was the community council by <coughs> changes that they're making it happen. Uh, well, we're trying to accomplish, accomplish two things. One is a change in the timing of the approval of community members. And the second is we're hoping that we will be able to enable staggered terms. And the logic for that is the same as for virtually every board at Amherst. It's to provide a little bit of institutional memory and uh, Students come and go with great rapidity. I use Maddie McPhee as an example. And uh, to have some uh, constancy there that, that uh, makes decision making and, and uh, reminds the new members what we've gone through and uh, how things have evolved has often been helpful. It's not always, some things are new and, and different and challenging. Uh, we have a very good community council at the moment. The five of us that represent the community are at a significant uh, learning curve problem because by the time we are actually approved under the present timing, anywhere from two to five meetings have taken place in the fall. And we've also missed the retreat of the organization that precipitates everyone knowing everyone's name and knowing a little bit about each other. Uh, when we came in this year, I believe it was in October, I'm not 100% sure, I'd have to look it back up. But, uh, you know, by that time, the students aren't using each other's names, they know each other by then. And so there are still students in community council whose names I do not know, and that's unusual. Now, it's also somewhat COVID related. I'm not in the building as much as I used to be, but uh, it does provide us with a, a, a handicap that I think is unnecessary. And lastly, there are there is work that can be done over the summer, and uh, community members could be active participants and be helpful. But because we don't know who we are at that point, we really can't participate. Uh, I don't think I need to describe the logic of the staggered terms. Uh, right now it's five one, five off each year. You could conceivably have five completely new members. Uh, we've been fortunate historically that uh, some of us have come back for multiple years, one year at a time. But I think if we could run a, a one year, two year kind of a timeline, uh, it would make us that much more effective and providing help to the to the students that each year are new to their various uh, officer roles and uh, responsibilities. We just elected new ones the other day, and uh, if they come in and they don't really know what's going on around them, they'll learn quickly, of course, but uh, I, I think we can be much more effective and uh, enjoy it more if the timelines moved up so that we are appointed in the spring and uh, are part of the process starting in the July 1 period forward for another year. Yeah, and it would follow the same time period that they elect the new moderator, a new school board rep and everything to it all be in the spring. So they'd be working together as a group. Okay. So on welcome to questions. Yeah. Um, so did you say the uh, year you alluded to, or did you come right out and say two-year terms? Yes. Or, yeah. 
Uh, what I'm hoping for is staggered term. Yeah, yeah. It's and one and but seven I'm saying, two. But two years, so one and two. You have one, let's say two people, or whatever the number is, right. uh, you go for one year, and then the other balance goes for two years, and then next year, then two years every time after that. So we could either do it that way, or we could do what other boards in town do, you apply for either for one or the two year term. Okay. I don't think. Yeah, I thought they were going to do a rotating. So yeah, we, we'd have to, like, the first year, we would have to do some yeah. for one year and some for two years. And, and then and then, and then it would be two on. years going on. Yeah. But this logic. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Simple. And then we would also have it so Mont Vernon rep would be on either mm -hmm. group to make sure that there's always a rotating. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So they passed their bylaws. There's no policies that we would change any of this and we don't oversee community council bylaws um, so for us it's really just a procedural change um, so if there's any other questions um, what I'd like to do is put out a plea for members that are interested in being on community council um, we will get this advertised right away I don't know can I work with Abby on that or um, and we'll get it out there so that we can um, look at their letters that they can send to us. Um, we'll put out the, the standard request um, to say why you're interested in being on community council. And in June, we will go ahead and select the members and then we can let community council know. And so as soon as they start their work in the summer, they've got the board reps already. And it's a little cool. more challenging getting the word out as we all know who have run for office with a digital and or citizen is, is a real challenge, but uh, Everywhere. We'll see if we can get out emails from the school parents and yeah. we'll get in the Amherst's and well, we have to go PTSA, PTA. PTA. And we can use the new sign. And we can use the new sign. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. I think I worked on that for three years. Use it. <laughs> we can use the new sign. <laughs> so um, I. <clears throat> Just so you know, if, it, if this did need approval, I would be in full support. It's a very sensible thing to do. Thank you for bringing it forward or whoever your group was who brought it forward. Um, on the staggered terms, so there's five of you now. Um, I don't know if all five wish to remain or somebody which is to go. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so maybe we could massage the staggered terms so that person's position would be a two-year spot let's just say I'm just, exactly right rick let's assume he's going to stay on maybe we we'll just consider you to be two well, year i, I, I mean what we're do i don't know we'll just get the we'll pool say, we'll, we'll ask and you can they can say where they want a one-year term or a two-year term and just start the from we'll there just start clean okay so mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah absolutely yeah, yeah, so absolutely right. Cool the existing members because they are up to speed a bit. I should have done that before. Mm -hmm. But so, so yeah. just as an aside note, that our senior leadership is extraordinary this year. Mm -hmm. but, <coughs> yeah. There are every year, but yeah. If you ever have a chance to stop at a community council meeting, it's worth it to see them in action. It's it's impressive. It's a night meeting this week. <laughs> you know, well, you're right well, on top of the SAU meeting. <laughs> one of the last bastions in America for true democracy. So I recommend you come by just for pressure. Talk. Yep. So thank you. Anything else? I think that's it. And thank you, Maddie. Anything else from community council? Because I know we're going to talk next week yeah, that's a about the other <laughs> the other proposal. Okay. Um Oh, diplomas. Mr. O'Keefe, would you like to introduce this one? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty simple concept. Um, the thought process that I was floating around, I spoke to Dan about it quickly, and then it came back to me. Thank you. Um, was to allow board members with a graduating senior, uh, the board members to sign their child's diploma. And I think as a board member or as a board here, we can authorize any one of us in that particular instance to sign on behalf of the board. 
uh, on that particular diploma. I don't think it's a legal issue. I think it's just something we can easily simply do. Stephanie told me she already picked up all the diplomas at the, uh, the SAU office and has to sign them manually anyway. So it's just a matter of just pulling out two or three. Um, so John, you can sign your daughters. Anna, you can sign your daughters. And Chrissy, I don't know if you have a senior or not. Uh, but she's at Manchester with you. Um, oh, okay. So, like, yeah. there'd just be. Is we want other board members. So, George. Yeah, I think that would probably create problems now. Keep it as Daddy's. just so he can sign more members. The, the, yeah, I don't think a board member from a different board, okay. and so he can yeah. sign. That's what it. I wanted to ask. Yeah, I don't think. But, that's, that's, but yeah. any board member from any of the three boards is invited to come up on stage and hand their child their diploma. That yeah. that still remains. I think it's a nice uh, a nice touch. I think. Uh, it's very respectful of the time and contributions that the people on this board do to our community. And I think uh, it's, to be honest with you, as a kid receiving a diploma that's signed by their mom or dad is, is a pretty cool thing. So um, I know other school districts have done it and there's no reason why we couldn't do it as well. And again, I don't think that we have a policy on this. It's literally just so, a procedural change. So, yeah. you know. I can make the motion. Motion, let's see. Yeah, I'll make the motion to permit any board member with a graduating senior to sign on behalf of the board on their child's diploma. Second. Any any discussion? Those in favor? Those in favor? John and I are in parts of the same. No. Okay. <laughs> no in favor. Anyone? No, but those? just because you may doesn't mean you have to. Not opposed. To that. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> we shall move that. <laughs> um, so I'll talk to those with graduating seniors because I know where the diplomas are. Um, the last item, um, do we want to do public input before we do that? Because we're Public input, two of two, please approach. Make sure you're on the green light. Okay, Lisa, you start with Amber. Speaking of diplomas and all of that, next year, uh, this is the plea I'm putting out. Next year will be my 10th year as a substitute teacher in this school district. And I would like to be able to give my kid his diploma because teachers get to, school board members get to, other employees of the district get to, and um, I just am gonna put that out there that substitutes are employees and- They're kind of like a permanent substitute. I can <laughs> guarantee you we have been in the trenches with everyone the past few years so I am just putting that out there. That Substitutes think. absolutely absolutely can. They're more than welcome to starting even this year. So. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right. I will say my son, when I asked my son, uh, he was terrified. A year or so ago, he was like, just give me the last one. <laughs> <laughs> but that's As what we do best. <laughs> Anyone else from the public? Anything? No? All right, seeing none, the last item on our list are board nominations and resignations. Maddie, if you want to go, please. <laughs> Have a good evening. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you. I have uh, two nominations. I'm happy to do them in public. If there's any questions about the candidates themselves, we'll need to go into non-public for that. I also have a couple of resignations uh, that we probably should discuss in non-public prior to you accepting them. So, so can I make a motion? Sure. Non -public For what, 190 to be subsections A and C. Subsections A and C. But you'll, there'll be one anyway between while we're setting up the. Okay, okay. yeah. Second. All right, so going into non public, yes, roll call vote. Yes. Yes, roll call vote. Lever, yes. Hey, you yes. Grund, yes. Peter, yes. Lynn Foreman, yes. All right, we will go into non public. <laughs> 